morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 28th meeting of 2017. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is consideration of the affirmative instrument on the International Organisations Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Number 2 Order 2017 Draft. I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, Walter Drummond Murray, Civil Law and Legal Systems Division, and Greg Walker, Solicitor Director of Legal Services um, with the Scottish Government. Um, this will be a chance for members to put questions to the Minister and officials at any points uh, they seek clarification on the instrument before we formally dispose of it and I refer members to paper one which is a note by the clerk and invite the Minister to make a, a short opening statement. Good morning and thank you convener. The draft international organisations immunities and privileges Scotland amendment number two order 2017 confers various legal immunities and privileges upon the U unified patent court or UPC. The UPC is an international judicial body supported by 25 EU member states, including the United Kingdom. On 19 February 2013, the UK government signed the Intergovernmental Agreement to provide for a unified patent court within participating European Union countries. The Protocol on Privileges and Immunities was done in Brussels on 29 June 2016. The order before the committee today fulfils Scotland's part uh, of the obligations that entail from these international agreements. Equivalent provision in respect of reserved matters and devolved matters in the rest of the UK is being conferred by legislation at Westminster. To the extent that the privileges and immunities relate to devolved matters in Scotland, however, conferral rightly falls to the Scottish Parliament. When respect of parliamentary passage is complete, both orders will go before the Privy Council. Whilst this order is limited to the issue of privileges and immunities, I think it might be helpful to, to say a little about the background to the UPC itself. The Unified Patent Court will be a court common to the contracting member states and thus part of their judicial system. It will have exclusive competence in respect of European patents and European patents with unitary effect. Uh, and unitary effect means that the patent will not need to be validated in each of the contracting uh, states, but that the patent will provide uniform protection in all uh, uh, 26 EU countries contracting to the agreement. The UPC's rulings will have effect in the territory of those contracting member states having ratified the agreement at the given time. The UPC will not have any competence with regard to domestic patents. The Preparatory Committee of the UPC, a committee of representatives from signatory states tasked with bringing the UPC into being, has stated its aim of bringing the agreement into force in spring of 2018. To meet this deadline, the UK and, Ger and the UK, the United Kingdom and Germany must deposit their instruments of ratification late 2017. The decision to sign up to the international obligations providing for UPC falls within the reserved responsibilities of the UK Government and the Parliament at Westminster. Many stakeholders have welcomed the establishment of the UPC. Uh, for example, the Law Society of Scotland said it strongly recommended that the UK should try to ensure that the UPC agreement does enter into force and that the UK can continue to participate fully in the agreement. To enable the UPC to fulfil its purposes and carry out its functions, certain privileges and immunities must apply by virtue of the protocol I referred to earlier. The conferral of immunities and privileges is effectively a condition of membership and is necessary to enable the court to function as an international organisation in the UK. The specific purpose, therefore, of this order is to provide immunities and privileges on the UPC and its officials in the course of official activities in Scotland in order to reflect the equivalent Westminster order and the terms of the protocol on privileges uh, and uh, immunities. The order provides that judges, the registrar and the deputy registrar shall have immunity from suit and legal process in respect of things done or omitted to be done in the course of performance of official duties. This immunity can be waived by the presidium of the court the court officers uh, I just mentioned shall also be exempt from devolved and local taxes in respect of salaries, wages and the emoluments paid to them by the court. No individuals are exempt from council tax. Representatives of a state party to the, to the agreement will also enjoy immunity from legal process when they attend meetings in their official capacity of committees set up under the agreement. This immunity can also be waived by the presidium of the court. This immunity does not apply to a person who is a British citizen or any person who at the time of taking up his functions within the court is a permanent resident of the United Kingdom. 
In the particular case of motor vehicle incidents, the court itself has no civil or criminal immunity where the vehicle belongs to or is operated on behalf of the court. Immunities and privileges are therefore limited in that they apply only to official actions and can be waived. They do not give an individual carte blanche to commit criminal activity. An assault, for example, could still be prosecuted in the normal way. The immunity is therefore analogous but more limited than that which has been for generations conferred upon diplomats working in foreign jurisdictions. As with diplomatic immunity, all individuals benefiting from privileges and immunities in Scotland are expected to respect Scots law, both the criminal and the civil law. In conclusion, convener of the order will help the UK fulfil its international obligations in respect of Scotland and it is the duty uh, of the Scottish Government to bring it forward to the Parliament. Uh, and I hope that that rather long summary, but I think hopefully members felt it was useful. Uh, and I would bring my remarks to a close simply by inviting any questions that uh, members may have through the Chair Convener. Well, thank you for that comprehensive opening statement, which was very helpful, Minister. Do members have any questions for the Minister? John Finney. <coughs> Good morning, Minister, and thanks for that statement. Uh, you'll be aware I have a keen interest in this, this matter, as, as do my party. And if I could ask just a, a couple of questions, please. It is about the location of the premises of this organisation, which seems to be a very worthy organisation, but wh where would they be located in Scotland, please? So the, the position at the moment is that the, the uh, way in which the court will be structured is that the, uh, there will be no local division uh, of the court cited uh, uh, at the present time or going forward in Scotland. However, I have uh, further to correspondence with the UK government uh, secured the undertaking that that matter will be under review and will be looked at in terms of future demand. So what could happen is that there could be a sitting uh, of the court, the D local division court in Scotland, depending uh, upon uh, need in terms of any particular case. So that would be uh, the, the physical presence of the court as we anticipate it in the, the initial years, certainly, of the court being in operation. And, and were that to be the case in Scotland, then that would be considered an occasional or temporary premise. That's right. Um, for which the provision of inviolability of premises does not apply. That's correct. Why is that? Uh, I would ask the officials to give chapter and verse on the legal reasoning. <coughs> the legal reasoning. In terms of the enabling powers for these orders under the um, International Organisations Act 1968, neither the Scottish nor the UK governments can go any further than the protocol enables. So the protocol doesn't require um, immunities in the situation of a temporary premises um, and so we, we couldn't confer them and there's no policy reason to confer them in those circumstances. The order has been passed, the Foreign Office, we understand that interested um, the people preparing for the UPC are aware of this work and, and that's all in order. So if I may, in relation to paragraph 9 and the, the covering note that we have here which says that uh, um, paragraph 4 provides that the court shall uh, have like inviolability of premises, which means that, and I quote here, agents of the state, such as the police, cannot enter without permission, then if something is termed an occasional or temporary location, the police could enter there. They wouldn't have inviability. Uh, that's just in circumstances which we foresee in the years, initial years going forward, whereby the, the court will not have a, a physical presence in Scotland, uh, although we have asked for that, but as I say, that is under... Uh, advisement, uh, but that there could be a sitting of the court uh, in uh, Scotland depending on the needs of a particular case and in those circumstances the inviability of premises is not uh, required by the, uh, the policy uh, uh, direction and therefore has not been provided for in this stat uh, statutory instrument. Okay, uh, it's, it's good to hear that you're um, chasing um, um, work in the area. Would that be termed then a local or a regional division if it was cited in Scotland? I understand if it were to be cited in Scotland in due course, which we will continue to press for and which the Law Society of Scotland supports, uh, it would be a local uh, division, a local oh, court okay, division. Okay. Right. In relation to, to paragraph 12 of the covering note, um, they shall also be exempt from devolved and local taxes in respect of salaries, wages, emoluments uh, paid to them by the court. Has that been quantified? Uh, I, I suppose it would be quite difficult to quantify because the numbers would um, Do we know the vary. numbers, Minister? Well, the numbers would vary because we don't know <clears throat> what number of officials that could apply to in Scotland at this point. But I think the, the important point to stress, uh, which I, I hoped I, I did in my opening statement, is that the, um, 
the immunity obviously relates to acting in your official capacity and it is concerned primarily, of, of course, with income tax uh, and the reasons for that I have uh, <coughs> advised in a previous committee session relate to the integrity of the operations of the international organisation and the, the fact that they, in senior positions anyway, as far as this organisation is concerned, will all pay the same rate of in income tax, of tax as set by the rules of the international organisation. So it's not an exemption from council tax, for example. Um, for senior uh, officials, uh, the exemption for vis-a-vis -vis income tax, that will not apply with regard to tax on pensions, for example. So it is not a, a kind of a absolute blank check. There are uh, particular heads of uh, categories involved and within that, uh, there's a different approach in terms of income tax or tax on pensions, for example, for more senior uh, officials of the court. But, uh, with respect, Minister, if we don't know the numbers and we don't know the sum, then we don't know the value of the cheque. And in relation to what's referred to as the financial effects, then uh, there'd be no uh, business regulatory impact assessment undertaken. Um, I'm not sure how the conclusion, there can be no financial effects on the Scottish Government, local government or businesses can be made. I don't, I'm not sure how you would be able to make that statement. Well, the, the, the fact is that there is no direct impact uh, at this time. And also, this is a, an SSI that is extending the conferral of, of privileges and immunities uh, as far as any potential devolved activity is concerned, as we are required to do in order to secure the UK government being able to implement its international uh, obligations. And the UK government, uh, as far as I'm aware, actually proceeded with a fairly extensive uh, process of uh, uh, impact assessment, if you like, in terms of the underlying principal uh, piece of legislation concerning the, the joining of the UPC. So that is where this engagement took place and where the impacts were looked at. And what we are at being asked to do and what I'm asking the committee to consider today is to look at this order uh, favourably, which is to, as I say, in statutory instruments in Scotland, extend the uh, conferral of privileges and immunities to uh, uh, Scotland as far as default matters are concerned. Okay, two very... I, um, is it the case, Minister, that most of them or the, everyone will be domiciled in, in London? Um, well, that remains to be seen. Certainly, um, there is a, a difference in, in categorisation for... Um, so you have the senior judges and they have a particular regime with regard to income tax. Then you have the, the, the next level down, which is the, are the general members of staff. Now, they may well be British citizens or have permanent residence uh, in the United Kingdom. And as regards the position of those individuals, if they are British citizens or permanently resident in the UK and are deemed to be members of staff of the UPC, they will not be, uh, they will not be able to benefit from this immunity uh, and privileged regime as far as income tax is concerned. So it, it is a wee bit complicated because yeah. there are different uh, categories of, of individual concerns. Yeah. That is the position as far as your ordinary member of staff is concerned. Yeah. Briefly, uh, John. Yes, are you able to provide an aggregate number? If you recall, the last time we discussed this, there was some divide as to the number. If, even if you could write to the committee on that, that would be helpful. I'm always and, happy to ask officials yeah. to look into the matter further. I think it would be very difficult at this stage to anticipate exactly the numbers of people you were talking about as far as devolved uh, issues in Scotland were concerned, but I am happy to ask officials to look into that. I, am, am I able to submit a patent in Gaelic? And if not, could you <laughs> chase the obligation for it to be submitted in Gaelic? I'd be delighted to, to thank you very uh, much proceed indeed. with that. Uh, I'm afraid I don't Stuart know off Stevenson? the top of my head the answer. Yeah, thank you. Just to uh, pick up the issue of inviolability of premises and the fact that not all the temporary premises are not, I take it that in no way cuts across the provision uh, that the official archives and papers of the court remain inviolable, even if in temporary premises which are not themselves inviolable. Remain inviolable, yes, according to general international law principles. Thank you, Liam MacArthur. Yeah, I'm the wholly supportive of the of the, um, the, the, the instrument. I, I think just picking up on John Finney's uh, question there around the impact assessment. I mean, like John Finney, I was um, I, I was struck by what was set out in, in 
Paragraph 16, particularly 17, where it, it, it talks about no impact at all. Uh, you, you fairly pointed to the work undertaken by the UK government where, where the responsibility for much of this resides. I mean, I think perhaps in future, if we're looking at these sorts of instruments, it would be helpful if that was fleshed out a little more in some of the detail. The findings from that sure. impact assessment could be shared, even if it's not been directly undertaken by the Scottish government. Absolutely happy to do that. Very good point. From them. Right. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, then we move straight to agenda item number four or uh, number two, which is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported in this instrument and has no comment on it. The motion is Motion 07771, that the Justice Committee recommends that the International Organisation's Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment No. 2 Order 2017 draft be approved. Minister, do you want to make any further comments and to move the motion? I, I move the motion. Thank you. Um, do, uh, do members have any comments to, to make? No. If not, then the question is that motion 07771 in the name of Annabel Ewing is approved. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we are not agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Okay. All those against? Thank you. Um, the result is 10 in favour, 1 against. And uh, that concludes consideration of the affirmative instrument. The committee's port, uh, report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Uh, is the committee content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the draft um, of the report? Yes. yes. Yes, thank you for that. Minister, can I thank you and your officials for attending today? I suspend briefly to allow a change of witness. Three is our third evidence uh, is our third evidence session on the civil litigation expenses and group proceedings Scotland Bill. And I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk, and paper three, which is a spice paper. And it's my pleasure to welcome our first panel of witnesses, Simon Dirolo QC from the Faculty of Advocates, Andrew Stevenson, Vice President, Glasgow Bar Association, and Kim Leslie, Convener of the Civil Justice Committee with the Law Society of Scotland. Can I thank all the witnesses for providing um, written submissions? That's um, hugely helpful for the, um, for the committee. Before I move to questions, I invite Liam Kerr to make a declaration. Thank you, Convener. I, just to declare uh, an interest insofar as I'm a director and 100% shareholder of Trinity Care Limited, which is a provider of legal services, and I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland. Thank you for that declaration. We now move to questions. And if I could start perhaps in the area of successful um, fee arrangements and ask the panel members whether the changes in the bill which would allow lawyers to enter into damaged base agreements are something they support. 
Kim Leslie. Yes, yeah. thank you, thank you, Chair. Y yes, the, the Law Society has um, welcomed this change in the the way in which personal injury claims and other civil litigation could be funded. We understand that there has to be some regulation and cap to the DBAs for public protection, but broadly speaking, we are welcoming this, uh, this um, liberalisation of how solicitors can provide legal services to their clients. It, one of the things that we are we welcome is the simplicity of our damage base agreement. It's something that we hope will enable a clear communication with the public so that the, 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 the public can understand what it is that they're getting and what it is that they're going to be paying at the end of the day. Okay. Other views just to open? Mm -hmm. I'm I would agree that uh, these uh, proposals are welcome and um, support them. Uh, I would, well, the, the, the Glasgow Bar Association would also support the introduction of this uh, legislation in so far as it permits this form of uh, contract. There's clearly uh, some degree of uh, secondary legislation to be introduced as well, which we'd be interested in seeing. But in principle, we are agreeable to it. Okay. Well, given the damage-based agreements give lawyers direct interest in the outcome of the case... Does the panel consider whether any changes will be needed to the current professional standard regimes to deal with uh, conflicts of interest? The, the, I think we have to be um, mindful that, that there is already provision of this type of work being carried out. I don't, I don't foresee that there's going to be a need for uh, a change in the regulatory regime, but what you've built in with this bill is where there are, are there potential <coughs> conflicts, for example, in future losses, the bill is already trying to build in uh, a visibility on that and putting some additional protections in place so that when conflicts potentially could arise, there are ways of dealing with that for the public protection. Could you elaborate on, on what protections? Mm. Well, for example, what, what the bill seems to suggest is that where there is a, where the legal provider has not recommended a future loss is taken as a periodical payment order, there requires to be independent scrutiny by an actuary to certify or the court must effectively certify that it's in the client's best interests for the, the future payment to be made by way of lump sum rather than PPO. We'll be covering um, future losses in more detail as we um, continue with the line of questioning. Mr. Just in relation to the specific question that you asked about um, professional regulation, uh, as far as council are concerned, they do have a duty of um, uh, independence and they also have a duty uh, to not to present a case unless it is statable. There is also uh, a case um, from the inner house in the 1930s uh, which, as far as I'm concerned, is still good law, which maintains that to conduct a, a um, case on a speculative basis, there must be reasonable prospects of success. So there is in place uh, at the moment uh, a requirement on council to not to conduct a case unless there are reasonable prospects of success uh, a case may not be stated unless it is statable, which I suppose is another way of saying the same thing. Um, in terms of uh, going forward, uh, it may be that uh, protocols are needed to ensure that uh, cases are not presented um, where there is not uh, a reasonable prospect of success. By that I mean that there are pre-action protocols that are in place. I believe that those, those protocols are, um, are envisaged uh, and also that case management procedures in the courts are also designed to ensure that 
cases cannot be presented unless uh, there is a, a, a statable basis and that summary dismissal of uh, uh, cases that have no merit is possible. I don't have anything to add. Okay, um, supplementaries from Liam MacArthur and Liam Kerr. Uh, just following up the, the point Kamala made about the, the uh, involvement of um, actuarial advice, um, it came up during our uh, evidence sessions last week um, that this would have to be sought in the absence of the solicitor, and that had actually raised some, uh, some eyebrows. Uh, from your perspective, do you see any problems with a client having to seek that actuarial advice and not having their <coughs> solicitor present, or is that something that is assumed to work um, and, and be in place for good reason? That gives, if, if that gives comfort, effectively, that there is, there is no taint to the advice, that then that, that would, would be something that the Law Society would accept. Whether it's, strictly speaking, necessary, because in these high-value cases, you're generally going to have a legal provider, potentially senior and junior counsel, maybe even a financial guardian. Um, what, what, we, what, we, what we, are, we want to accept is that given there is a change where effectively a solicitor is for the first time going to have a stake in the outcome of the litigation, if this gives comfort that the, the public is being protected, then we would, we would, <coughs> we understand the reasoning behind it. But one of the things that we have as, as, as lawyers is always a duty to act in the best interest of our client. So these, types of arrangements are ongoing. And what is comforting is that there are very few complaints to the Law Society of Scotland about these types of arrangements with, with um, claims management companies where they're being operated as a funding vehicle, but the work is being carried out by solicitors because of the transparency involved in it. Um, but short answer is we, believe that the primary um, objective must be to include future losses at the appropriate tapered level. If this is something that the committee feels is essential for the, 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 the public to have that protection, then I think that is, that is something that we can, we can certainly understand and we would be prepared to accept. Okay, Liam Kerr. Just briefly, thank you, Convener. Uh, the, this point about the actuary and or the court certifying that the deal is in the client's best interest, isn't that a tacit admission that the true independence uh, of the profession, of which the profession is rightly proud, uh, is potentially compromised? Uh, and or could there be a perception that the independence of the profession is being compromised uh, by the public? Well, essentially, I, th I think the point I made earlier is that there's going to be a number of people advising in, in these types of case. Um, absolutely. I, I have, I have um, experience of this type of work, and certainly I haven't ever felt conflicted in my advice to a, to a client. If this gives comfort, as I say, if this gives comfort that it is, it is necessary, but in my view, um, I don't think that you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Effectively, what you're, what, but what you're doing is anticipating if there is going to be a, a, a choice, which means that you're either going to be paid more by way of success view or less, then... If you were saying, well, the, the, the lawyer should always be able to make the right choice because it's in the, the interest of the client, I would say, yes, I agree with you. But if, there, if this, is, this is an extra stage that says this can be advice without taint, well, frankly, the, the advice is probably going to be the same as the lawyer was going to be giving in the first instance. Stuart Stevenson? Um, oh, sorry, did someone want to come in on that? I wanted to comment on this um, particular point because I, I am concerned. I mean, on behalf of the faculty, we have actually made some comment about a concern about how this provision, I think it's um, clause 6.6 uh, six of, the, of, the, of the draft bill, but um, of the bill rather. Um, our concern here is that, as uh, Mr Kerr has just indicated, it does carry with it the 
um, statutory um, uh, suggestion that there is a conflict and that the lawyers cannot be trusted. Um, and that has, has, is, a, I think, problematic. Um, what I would say about this is that it's not clear to, to, to the faculty what, what, how an, an, an independent actuary is actually going to assist with the question that requires to be answered in a situation like this. Um, the, the, point, the purpose of an actuary is to, to give um, advice in terms of how a calculation will work out. But the decision as to what to do in the light of that calculation is something for the client to take. And the client should have an independent advice from counsel in cases of this kind normally, um, invariably in my experience, and also a financial guardian will be present, usually a professional person. Um, so uh, the other thing I would say is that I've never come across a solicitor in my experience who is not conscious of the need to do what is in the best interests of the client in circumstances such as this. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, the, the uh, uh, Taylor proposal creates a conflict and then seeks to resolve it. Uh, and I, I would suggest that the way around this is to, is to avoid the conflict. And the way to avoid the conflict is to uh, allow the solicitor to charge a fee where there is a periodical payment order. That means there isn't a conflict between a lump sum and a periodical payment order. And some, some mechanism of allowing some fee to be charged in those circumstances surely can be found. It would have to be some small percentage, a very small percentage, uh, of uh, the, uh, the value going forward, for perhaps for a number of years, of the periodical payment order. And that money could be found from the damages, but not affecting the future element, because there'll be enough in a claims, there'll be enough in claims of this of, of the size that we're talking about here, to to pay the fee without uh, affecting uh, the ability to fund future care, etc. No one else want to comment on that, Stuart Stevenson. Um, as a mathematician and someone who's been involved in uh, financial things, I have undertaken actuarial calculations. In law, does that make me an actuary? Well, I would imagine that um, the idea is that somebody who's an actuary is a, somebody who's a member of the faculty of actuaries. Now, that would have to be... Uh, I don't know what, whether... <laughs> I don't know whether the faculty of actuaries are, 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 are happy about all of this and their members are keen to get involved mm. in cases in, and, and to do what they're being asked to do in this type of situation. I don't know whether that's been um, considered. Um, I think I'm on the same page. I would not wish to be described as an actuary in these terms, but I just wondered if we were aware of a legal definition of actuary. Uh, and, and related to that, and this may not be a question for the panel really, uh, whether there are professional standards for actuaries that would cover their independence, being part of their professional duties, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, the, I am aware that they're, they're, they, they do, of course, have professional standards as a professional body, mm. and no doubt that, uh, but you'll have to ask them, or that body, or other, and their, uh, the representative body to, to deal with this aspect of matters, I think. Thank you. Can I ask the panel what they think the impact will be on lower value cases once caps on the fee levels under the SFA <coughs> are introduced? On, on lower value claims, um, so are you suggesting that the, the, the power to cap in a, in a written speculative fee agreement? Well, the, once the lower value and the cap has been agreed and it is perhaps looking a low value case not worth the, the solicitor's um, time doing things, will that have an impact? I think well, there's a decision we're always We're always keen for the judicial expenses to be increased as, um, to, to, to actually mean that what we're getting paid for the work done is, is, is met. But the, in the lower value cases, the proportionality has to come into it and it's, it's about fairness again to the client because if it's a low value claim what we don't want to do is take 
too much of their damages. So it's, is it likely not to go on a no-win, no, um, no, no lower, lower value claims, like, like any other claim, will be, will be assessed as the best way, effectively, of, 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 do, of doing the work. There are no options. That's, that, that's what you're introducing here. There are no options. And so a, a client or a, a consumer is effectively going to have to then work out what is a, what, what's available on the market and what... And, and, the, and the lawyer is going to have to have a, 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 an analysis of these cases and how they can work the cases profitably um, while still ensuring that the client is getting the majority of their damages. Anyone else like to comment? I suppose the, the, the fear is that um, lawyers may be attracted to, to cases where they know there's guaranteed income and um, are more lucrative and that despite the bill trying to, to um, make access better for um, the individuals, then if it's a very low value case, no win, no fee may not be taken up. That, that's not been our experience. Thank you, Doug. Some panel members highlighted their submissions that access fee um, arrangements where the lawyer gets a fee uplift were currently used in family actions. This would be prevented by provisions in the bill <coughs> Can you explain your concerns in this area? Faculty indicated a, a, a concern there. Um, it's important not to overstate the, the concern here because I don't think it happens very often. But there are cases in which, where there's a dispute about financial provision on divorce or dissolution of a civil partnership or cohabitation, where there's an asset which is to be preserved uh, or, or, or a share of an asset is to be sought, that um, council might be instructed on a no win, no fee basis, not on a uh, percentage of the asset to be recovered or preserved, but just on a, uh, if, if, that, if there's an achieved result, then they'll be paid, and if there isn't, they won't be paid uh, a fee. Um, now, that doesn't happen very often, but it happens from time to time. It would be useful if that uh, could be maintained as a possibility uh, going forward, the, the current draft of the bill doesn't seem to permit that, as, uh, the, way it's, uh, the way it's framed, and our concern was is if it's possible that it should be uh, amended or, or uh, altered in order to allow that to happen. So it's very much a niche situation? Yes, it, it, it is. Yeah. It's quite... Un it, yes. It would be... Um, very helpful for me before we leave these, um, this line of questioning if you could each maybe um, give your estimate of at which points maybe before an action starts when you s represent a client from whether that goes on to pre-action protocol, judicial expenses, SFA, DBA, any uplift just at which point you receive a payment and approximately what, what percentage or, or, or how that's valued. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not following the question. So at what point, at what point is, as a lawyer then... I would like to know just when you're acting for a client, uh -huh. then at what stages do you receive payment and would you be receiving pay, payment if all the expenses were paid, including the pre-action protocol, okay. the SFA, the DBA, right. any uplift, judicial expenses? Okay, I follow. So <coughs> your payment for... The, so in, in a damage base agreement or uh, where you're in a damage base agreement, say you get an interim payment. So the, cl the claim has not concluded. It may be um, bef before it's gone into court or after it's gone into court. If there is an, a, a, an interim payment, you would be entitled to deduct your uh, success fee at, the, at that point of an interim payment. You may choose not to if there's a reason why you're getting an interim payment because you have to, the client has to pay for something, but effectively you would be entitled to do it at that point. At the uh, crystallisation of the claim, so when you get your, your cheque or your funds in from your opponent when you've won the case, you take your success fee and you pay the balance. At that point, your files are then... Um, reviewed by a law accountant and an account is drafted, negotiated and then the judicial expenses are either agreed or sent to taxation where 
a, an auditor will effectively determine what you're going to be paid by way of judicial expenses and you would get your judicial expenses at that point. I suppose I'm, I'm just trying to quantify, is there, um, when you're, you're totting up your fee and any interim final payment, the final settlement, will that include a payment having been taken for the, the pre-action pro protocol? No, no. Uh, well, well if, you've, if you've settled it for a pre-action protocol, that's out of court, so it's negotiated and there's a fixed fee effectively at that point and you would be paid when you've, when you've settled the claim. You've agreed, you've agreed with the opponent what you're getting paid by, for, for your client. It doesn't settle, it could still go ahead. So there would still be a charge for the pre application It hasn't settled, but for representing the client at the pre-action protocol, there's, is there that's still no, So it's either, it's either pre-action protocol, and that's out of court, or it's litigation, and that's judicial expenses. Right. So you get the fixed fee if it's settled out of court yeah. and you get your success fee over and above that. Yeah. But if it goes into court, you get your, your success fee and then the, there is judicial expenses based on a table of fees effectively um, for, for, for judicial work taken. You don't get anything for your pre-action protocol. Right, that's what I wanted to get at. Um, anyone else want to add to that or are you happy with that explanation? You're having a very I'm easy. happy with the explanation just, in, in, just so that the committee understands the position of council, which is that if, if council's acting on a, a speculative basis, a no win, no fee basis, then council will be paid at the end of the case. Uh, it's very unusual to be paid at any point before that. Um, uh, council will probably not, uh, almost certainly not, be acting on a um, damages-based agreement basis. Um, that will not be happening. Uh, council will continue to be instructed as they are at present, essentially on a no win, no fee judicial recovery basis. That's how it will work. Uh, there are reasons for that. But essentially, solicitor enters into a damages based agreement with, with the client. Uh, the council's not involved in that. We're brought in at, at a later stage, essentially as, a, as an independent consultant and, and paid as a result of a judicial recovery from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the person from whom the damages are being paid. Okay, Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, uh, Kim Leslie, you, you said earlier on how the lawyer can work the cases profitably. Um, are you aware of any evidence that suggests that extra reward, excuse me, reward to solicitors' firms is actually required here? Um, and secondly, to the whole panel. Um, is this actually going to solve the problem in the sense that isn't there a risk that the solicitor still prefers to choose the easy, more straightforward claims uh, or the ones most likely to settle, such as perhaps road traffic accidents, uh, whereas the more difficult cases, the less, uh, the, the longer ones, the evidentially challenging ones, stress claims, for example, uh, lower value, higher risk, remain unattractive and the problem hasn't been solved of taking those on? Well, you are solving that problem to an extent, uh, Mr Kerr, by introducing qualified one-way cost shifting. Because you're absolutely right. There, there, undoubtedly, there are, there are cases where the, the fault element is, is very straight. It, it should be straightforward. No case is guaranteed to win. Um, but there are some cases where the risks are, are higher than, than others and absolutely there are there are types of work which are more complex um, more time consuming re require greater uh, investigation and indeed f financial outlay in the <coughs> investigation and preparation of the case so what you're balancing and this is one of the things that this has to tie together I mean, uh, Chief principal taylor has, has has effectively looked at it on an overarching basis and what he's effectively acknowledged is that th there is an issue with some access to, with access to justice in certain types of case which may not be attractive simply because if you're if you're balancing it out and you're set, analyzing I'm going to have to invest so much money and time in investigating this and indeed if I lose it the, the cost ramifications are significant that becomes less attractive what you're doing with the introduction of quarks is effectively um, enabling certain work types to become viable, which may not be viable at present, given the risks involved 
in losing the case and paying adverse costs to your opponent? So I think the short answer to the question is it will improve the position but not resolve it altogether because there will still be, potentially, there will be difficult cases that will be unattractive to take on. Um, uh, that there, those, those cases will, will, will carry on probably. That won't, it won't completely resolve that problem. Um, and uh, the legal aid, uh, there, there is still a, a need for legal aid, in my view, that that, 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 that is a, 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 an important uh, resource uh, to allow those, those cases to be brought. Um, but the, the very difficult cases where legal aid is not available will still be difficult to bring. But um, I, the solution to that problem is, is, is not not one that's easily found, I don't think. Thank you, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Um, I was going to ask you about compensation for future loss, but I feel that's been covered quite extensively. So can I ask just for clarification on a point about periodical payments? If I understood correctly, Mr. Dirolo, you were saying that um, at the moment a solicitor can decide on that, and I want to know your view on when the, if the court can impose a periodical payment? Well, the, the current law is that in Scotland, a court cannot enforce uh, or require parties to go down the periodical payment route. Mm -hmm. It has to be done either by agreement of the parties, mm -hmm. and, and up until now, it's, it's quite rare for the agreement to be reached because either the, the pursuer doesn't want to do it or the defender doesn't <coughs> want to do it. And if one or the other of them don't want to do it, then it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. There, is, there are proposals for the law to be changed. Yes. There's been a recent consultation about that, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Yeah. Um, that will improve the situation. It will mean that the court will have power to say, irrespective of what the parties want to do, we, you, we, you, mm. the court's going to require it. Or, and even if one party wants to do it, then it, the court can then enforce it as well. So that will make a big difference to, to that. And I think one of the problems about this legislation is that... It, it, writing into it this provision without until we've resolved the periodical payment matter in the other proposal is is um, perhaps not a good idea because I think it should perhaps uh, making this requirement about an actuary certifying it and the court certifying it is something which the court currently doesn't have power to do and I don't know whether that legislation that's proposed will be passed or not mm -hmm. yeah okay that that's fine can I ask the rest of the panel's views on that please I, I don't have anything to add to Mr. Mr. De Rolla's evidence. Well, if, if I may then, the, effectively, the, the essential component for this is that what we don't want is, is taking comp future damages out of the equation altogether. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> periodical payment orders are something that may develop in, in, in Scotland, there might, be, there might be more of an uptake for it. We, we, have, we have a situation where the court is likely to be able to impose this on yes. um, uh, parties. Effectively, we are um, content with what the provisions are so far. So the Law Society view is that that's acceptable. You're, you're all right with that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Can I ask specifically why you think damages for future loss should be included? Well, I think Sheriff Principal Taylor said it quite clearly that effectively the, he's, he's balanced it out. And what, what, what the key thing is, rather than ring fencing, it's to, to get the percentage right so that it's, it's a modest amount. So that, again, doesn't... Um, benefit cases languishing, taking longer, because that, you know, effectively you, you want it to be incentivised that the cases are dealt with as expeditiously as possible. We are, we are we're looking at the, the amount as being very important, so that if it's a modest am amount, there's always likely to be enough in the past losses to ensure that the, 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 the care is, is, is taken care of. 
If it's 2.5%, frankly, with, with any future losses, there's always going to be a range. So the pursuer is going to have a value for that. The opponent is going to have a value for it. It's not necessarily going to be the same value. It's not a, it's not a fixed amount. There's always going to be a range. So the, the reality is the margin between those two figures is very unlikely to be two, you know, as, as, as little as 25 and Mr. Stevenson, do you have a view on that, why it should be included? Well, if I, if I could just say, uh, Madam Convener, that my organisation, the Glasgow Bar Association, doesn't generally get involved, in, its members are not generally involved in high value reparation actions such as those you're, you're referring to. So I don't really have anything to add to what the other speakers have said because they, in my submission, are far more qualified than than I am to give your committee useful information about these matters. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on then, Mary. Um, I'd like to discuss the qualified one-way cost shifting which uh, you raised earlier, um, which the bill would apply to personal inju injury cases based on what Sheriff Principal Taylor called the David versus Goliath relationship between pursuers and defenders. And my concern with that had been that while David and that David and Goliath scenario might be the majority of cases, really, what about the other cases uh, that make up some of the other situations? And I was wondering if you could highlight, if you had any examples of your own, to highlight those other situations uh, which might be caught up in that. Um, because when I raised this last week um, with the, some of the organisations we had giving evidence, I, I was told that the scenario, this is by Thompson solicitors, the scenario in which any of us or any of our colleagues in the profession would bring a personal injury claim against an ordinary person is virtually impossible. Um, so he said that that wouldn't really be the case, so I'd just be interested to hear your take on that and like I say, if you have any examples to add. Oh, yeah. there, are, there are quite a number of examples of um, individuals being sued in the non-accidental injury area, so for assault or for um, abuse or things of that kind. Now, they may not be insured. They're not public, they're not a public authority. They may not have resources. Um, and therefore, they're in a, you are in a David against David rather than a David against Goliath type scenario. We've suggested that um, quarks could be uh, only available to either uh, to an insured, somebody who is insured, a public authority, somebody who has the backing of the Motor Insurance Bureau, uh, or somebody who has, whose means and resources are such to enable them to make uh, payment of expenses. Now that, that formulation that I've just given you is the same type of formulation that you get in the interim damages rule of court, where you cannot get interim damages against uh, someone who's not a public authority or insured or has, whose means and resources are such to enable them to make uh, a payment. And the idea would be that uh, you, would pre you would be protecting individuals uh, against having financial ruin against them as being a, a, a reason for paying out uh, in a case, uh, paying, paying a small amount to get rid of a claim. That's the the protection. Now, these cases, I think, I think the word impossible is, is almost impossible, or the phrase almost impossible is too strong. They're rare, but they do occur from time to time. Okay. Um, extrapolate on that. It, it is not impossible for uh, a case to arise where you are suing an individual. Um, the abuse is it's going to be a feature, so... Um, survivor suing perpetrator, for an example. But what would be part of that analysis is whether that person is worth suing. Because clearly what you cannot um, do is take a person through a court exercise, which is a paper exercise. So in those circumstances, recoverability will be at the forefront of all the representatives of survivors and other, for example, an assault, um, harassment, um, stalking, for example. But effectively, in these cases, the first primary question is, you, you may have a great case in law, but is the person actually going to have the means to pay pound, shilling and pence out to you at the conclusion of the, the action? 
Thank you. Um, just to go back to Mr. Darrell, what you suggested in your submission as well. So, do you think that would be relatively straightforward to apply as part of this legislation? I would have thought so. That it could be. You, 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 I think the, 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 obviously the concern is you don't want to undermine the whole scheme by uh, having exceptions to the Quark's uh, uh, protection. But I would have thought it would be possible to, to build in a formulation of the type that I've indicated by, by using the, the phraseology from, from the interim damages rule. I'd also like to ask, um, I, given that if the bill goes ahead as it's currently drafted at the moment and with uh, quox as part of that, that you pretty much eliminate all the risk for the pursuer in bringing forward an action. Now, do you think that that would lead to a large increase in spurious claims that could come forward? It will lead to an increase. But whether it's a huge increase, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because if you take away the risk, there are those who will be inclined to sue in circumstances where otherwise they might not have sued. That's just, this is why I think there's a real problem with, with this. And in my opinion, the whole scheme is predicated upon uh, everyone having insurance, and that simply isn't the case. A collision, for <coughs> example, a collision between a cyclist and a pedestrian giving rise to a personal injury claim. It's unlikely that there's insurance involved there. But the fact is that on this scheme, the pursuer is not running any risk unless he or she is essentially at it, a, fr a fraudster or someone who's behaving completely unreasonably. But that would be very much the exception. And uh, I think as Mr. DeRolo has suggested, I think it would be far more appropriate to restrict this to situations where a defender is insured and has insurance covering his or her conduct of a litigation, because I think otherwise it will give rise to unfairness. Mm -hmm. I've certainly come across cases where um, there has been no insurance involved and it just doesn't seem to me to be fair to take away the application of the general principle that expenses follow success because essentially it will mean anybody who gets sued in a personal injury ca case is going to be out of pocket whether he or she is successful or not in, in defending the claim and that doesn't seem fair to me. Mm -hmm. Specific point, you say you quite you think it should be someone that was insured, but in your submission, um, you pose the question: What if the defender chooses not to involve his insurer because the value of the claim is uh, low relative to his policy excess, or does not want future loadings on his premium? Well, I would I would suggest pr that primarily this should not apply at all. If it is going to apply, then my suggestion to you would be to restrict it to situations where um, the defender either has insurance or chooses to invoke insurance. But it should be restricted. But, but my, prim my primary submission is that it should not apply at all. Okay. Oh, sorry, I just had a, yes, one absolutely. more question about that. And it was just about uh, to get your thoughts on after the event insurance. Uh, now, do you think this is uh, another alternative to that? Is that something that's commonly available in Scotland? or It's available at a price and quite a considerable price. It's okay. prohibitively expensive. After the event insurance, it's not available really from, from a practical point of view. Uh, I've got a recent example of... Um, I, I'm... I'm, I'm I am uh, not speaking first hand, but my understanding is it's extremely expensive to get and uh, it's not worth, worth trying to obtain, in fact. It's difficult to get premiums at a level that are manageable for, for, for cash flow for, for most legal firms. Okay, thank you very much. Liam Kerr. Just, uh, I think Marie Goujon makes a very important point about the removal of risk in this. So, uh, do, does the panel have any view on what impact or this will have on settlement negotiations and the prospects of settlement throughout the process? I have to say, I think that I think the lawyers and uh, both both sides of, both sides of the litigation have a real part to play in being gatekeepers for this for for. for for the courts, effectively. Um, one of the things that you, you're building in, um, that we might want to talk about a little bit more about the exceptions to quarks, but you're building in effectively um, conditions 
if, if, if met, which would remove the benefit of quarks, which is fraudulent representation. Oh, apologies. So there's no need to go into that, that aspect. Right. The question you were specifically asking is, is the removal of risk and what, what the effect that will have and on settlement. I think most cases, I don't, I don't think it will make a, a massive amount of difference. Currently, the cases in which uh, in defenders can recover uh, or actually do recover expenses are, are, relatively, are relatively rare. The most important incentive on the pursuing lawyer is that the pursuing lawyer will get paid if the case is settled or won and won't get paid if the case is, not, is lost. And if the case is lost, um, so there's a big incentive on the part of the uh, uh, pursuer's lawyer to, to resolve the case, if possible, on favourable terms, clearly. Uh, so um, I, I, do think, I do think that it, it's, it would be wrong to overstate uh, the effect that um, quarks will have on, the, on, on, on settling cases or by, by removing the, the risk of an adverse finding of, of expenses. I don't think it will have a serious effect on it. On, it will have some effect, but I don't think it will have a, a, a very large effect because I think the big incentive uh, is to uh, not to lose the case, otherwise you won't get paid. And there's, there are outlays that you're going to have as well that you're going to have to be responsible for for, for experts and, and, and medical witnesses and the like. And these are very, quite often very, very uh, high. But of course, tenders and the impact of tenders, which is a sealed bid effectively offering to, to settle the claim, will have on quarks. Do you follow? So, so, if, so in a situation where the defender has offered to settle the claim and has lodged a sealed bid in the court to say, I'm, 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 betting, I'm betting that this case is not going to be worth more than that, um, what is silent in this bill is the impact on quarks if the pursuer chooses to say, no, no, I want my day in court, I'm not taking this offer, I'm going, to see, I'm going, to, I'm going to, to take my chances. Now, in those circumstances, what Taylor had suggested mm -hmm. was that that removed effectively the benefit of quarks, save that the, there was a restriction. The pursuer would still get 25% of their damages, but if we effectively failed to beat this, this, this tender or sealed bid, then you would be paying the opponent the, their damages but on a, on a capped basis to 75% of the, 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 the court award. Mm -hmm. That's not here. Okay, thank you. Would you um, be satisfied if this is done in, in by regulation or should it be on the face of the bill, given that it's supposed to be reflect the findings of clarification? You know, we're supposed to know exactly what we're talking about. Well, one of the things the Law Society did say in their response is, is that we're, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, th this will come in an acted sedent. So th this is an enabling, but there's not a lot, there's not, there is an issue with, if it's not here in the face of the bill, then we're relying on you getting it in for clarity so that we can advise our clients on it. So if it's not in the bill, would you prefer to see it on the face of the bill or dealt with those rules of court? I would say uh, tenders are generally been, been, been dealt with, so it may be that there's a reason why it's not here, but I'm just raising it for the committee. If it could be put into the, the, the bill, that, that, that is for your, for your draftsman, but effectively, <coughs> I'm surprised it's not here, and it, there must be a reason why it's not. So a question for the minister, then. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, sh I would say that it should be, uh, there should be re a specific reference to tenders in the bill, because they are a very important part of right. this form of litigation. Okay. And Mr. DeRoo, no, and then down. Further to add. Yeah. Liam MacArthur, did you want to pick up? And and just picking up um, on some of the themes about to anticipate where this legislation may, may take us, and I, I appreciate there's uncertainties around it. Obviously, Quarks has been in, <coughs> in place um, south of the border for, uh, for a while now. Um, uh, at the time that Sheriff Taylor um, came forward with his, his report, the, the rate of increase of cases um, 
uh, using DWP data was fairly significant. There was a, a sense of a compensation culture um, south of the border that didn't exist um, north of the border. Since then, we've seen a rapid decline in the rate of increase in personal injury cases south of the border and a marked increase north of the border. So I, I would be interested to know whether you believe that any safeguards that have been put in place alongside um, quarks in its application south of the border are ones that we could learn lessons from in terms of the, the legislation we're scrutinising now or indeed subsequent um, SIs that may come forward as, uh, in, in due course. Well, one thing I suppose to, 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 to say at this stage is um, whilst there may be a, an increase in <coughs> personal injury claims, this bill effectively deals with civil, litig civil litigation. Quarks will deal with cases that are in court, and those have remained relatively steady over the last four or five years. So, and as long it's about legitimate claims, isn't it? It's about we, we, we effectively need to ensure that the cases where people are accessing justice are legitimate claims where the public are choosing to exercise their legitimate um, rights and, and, and seek a remedy. Is this the point where you want to discuss fraud and the exceptions to quarks? I think we're going to come on to that in a second. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll pause there. Mm -hmm. Right, could I bring Morris in? Um, I think you were going to go on to the, the quarks. Yeah, okay. thank you, uh, Kavina. Uh, panel, good morning to you. Um, do the pan panel members consider that the test for losing quarks protection in the bill implement what Sheriff uh, Principal Taylor recommended? think it does quite on the reasonable uh, there's the, 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 on the on the reasonableness test um, the wording doesn't seem to me to reflect what was suggested and indeed it was suggested to you by another witness uh, earlier in the month that it, it that the wording is the same as Wednesbury unreasonableness I'm not sure that it is uh, I don't I don't agree with that um, so, what I suggest, or what, we've, what the faculty has suggested, is, is that in terms of reasonableness, it should be, um, we've set it out that the wording should be that if in the opinion of the court, that person's behaviour is so manifestly unreasonable that it would be just and equitable to make an award of expenses against him. Now, that, that is a stronger uh, wording than, it, than is there. And I think that that is, some, that is required in order to, to make it clear that, you, that it's only where you've behaved um, manifestly, unreasonably, that you should lose the benefit of quarks. Um, in relation to abusive process, there's no issue about that, but then there is an issue about potentially about a fraudulent representation. And the wording there, I think, as you will see from our submission, is, is again, there's a, a concern that it, it's a little bit... Um, uh, too easy to, 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 to meet the test. It should be uh, a, a material fraud or so, something going to the root of, of the claim that, that uh, uh, results in you losing the benefit of quarks. I mean, the, the three... Uh, the, 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 the abusive process is the, is the essence of, all, of this. Um, mm -hmm. that if you've abused the process, then you should lose the benefit of quarks. And, and fraud and unreasonableness are just examples of abusive process. Mm -hmm. Any comments? So are you asking about, about the exceptions to the application yes. of quarks? Um, well, it seems to me that B would really take in A and C. Mm -hmm. um, although I think B is a bit nebulous. Um, the test that applies in relation to legal aid is quite interesting it, it, because frequently in where a party is in receipt of legal aid, there'll be a motion made for modification of his or her expenses if he, lose, he or she loses. And the test there is that the court will not uh, make someone in that situation liable for an amount um, which, is an, which exceeds an amount that's reasonable having regard to all the circumstances, including the means of all the parties and their conduct of, of, of the proceedings, which may sound a bit bland as well, but the courts generally know what that means, and it, in my experience it works fairly. Um, and I think that that would probably be the test that I think, if you're going to uh, introduce quarks, then I think the exception 
should probably be worded in, in a way similar to that, that that applies in relation to legal aid, because I think everyone understands what that means. It works reasonably well. Okay, so the principle. The principle is that the introduction of quark should give certainty. Certainty of what our exposure is going to be. Mm -hmm. What we certainly don't want is um, you're going to be protected unless. You're going to be protected unless. Because that effectively will, will end up potentially um, making anxious legitimate pursuers who, given litigation is a, a perceived as, as a, a costly business, they, they want... They want total reassurance that they are protected. Now, there is absolutely no doubt that the, the, the principle behind this is that quark should apply in the majority of cases, but there, there, the exceptions to that should be um, a high standard. So you should only lose quarks if, you're, if the conduct is such that it would be unjust and inequitable for, for quarks to, to apply. But what you don't want to do is effectively push people back into having to get insurance because of the exceptions. In relation to subsection A, makes a fraudulent representation. We at the society were concerned about that because, again, what we're trying to avoid at all costs is satellite litigation. So we talked in our response about the materiality. So it makes, makes material fraudulent represent, representation designed to materially increase the value of the claim. So we don't want, we want it to go to the root of the litigation, mm -hmm. rather than being a ancillary, they claimed they were off, a week for, off for three weeks and it was two weeks, and the paperwork, or the, so, so if you take my point, it's got to be to the root. Um, abuse of process, if I can pause and say that Lord Gill, in a, in a case in 2004, made reference to there are many diverse ways in which a litigant can abuse the process of the court. For example, by pursuing a claim or presenting a defence in bad faith and with no genuine belief in its merits, or by fraudulent means, um, or for an improper ulterior motive, such as that of publicly denouncing the other party. So from, from my part, the abuse of process could arguably be broader than that, was, that which was suggested at by, by Sheriff Principal Taylor, which was, for example, falsification of documents. Somebody had gone to court, borrowed out of process documents, and then put back different documents that were more advantageous. That, would, of course, would be an abusive process, but arguably, we would say that, that if you have A and C, you may not need B at all. Can I ask a further question? question, uh, Camina. Um, and therefore, you're saying that um, a number of the respondents have suggested the test of fraud should be replaced with the English test of fundamental dishonesty. Would you agree with that? Um, I'm, I'm slow to agree, to agree to it without considering it more carefully, actually. Um, but um, I, I, all I can say, I think, is that I'm, I'm keen that the test that's there at the moment is 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 a little bit light, and on, in relation to fraud, it needs to be um, uh, strengthened. It has to be a, it should be stronger and clearer mm -hmm. that, that there has been a fraud in relative to the claim. Mr. Stevenson, um, I don't think there's any need to introduce English terminology. All right. Uh, no, I think if you have if you have material fraud and abuse of process, that should be the exceptions to quarks. Right, okay. And, and therefore, finally, um, do you have any other suggestions on how the current tests as they appear in the bill could be improved? I think, well, I've, 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 I've made a suggestion in relation to the, 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 the B, the reasonableness one. Which right, went, and uh, that's as the three that, that yeah. yeah, okay. A and C, uh, Stevenson, you? Well, as, as, as I say, I think that, I think that we, you, you should look more towards the, the legal aid, Section 18, uh, 1986 Act exception there, because I, I think, as I say, that's been operating for decades now, and everyone knows how it, how it works, and it seems to me to work very well. Is that a justification for continuing? I think it's, well, I think it's a justification for using or replicating that, that test in 
in, in this bill because I think, as I say, we all know what it means and it, and it works well. And everyone, if you, if, if someone in receipt of legal aid shouldn't be able to use that as a, a means of pursuing a, a, a claim in bad faith. And you, you would always advise clients in that situation that they're not immune from an award of expenses simply because they have legal aid. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to abuse that. And I think that there is an analogous situation here. And I think that if you're going to introduce quarks, then you need to have a safeguard that is similar to that that exists where parties in receipt of legal aid. Okay, thank you. Okay. So in terms of uh, subsection A, makes materially fraudulent representation, which is designed to materially increase the value of the claim. Our, our position is that with, with, with A and C, you may not need B, but if, you've, if you're using, if you, if, you, if you maintain B, then we believe that it should be a, a Wensbury unreasonable, so manifestly unreasonable, and effectively draw the wording from that, because this, this wording is, it doesn't quite match the wording suggested by Sheriff Principal Taylor. Thank you, Camina. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Um, Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended that claims management companies should be regulated. Uh, under this bill, they will not be regulated, uh, and they probably won't be for a number of years at least. Uh, what are the consequences of not regulating claims management companies under this bill? You, you are, you, effectively, you're putting the solicitor and a claims management company not on level playing field. Um, there's obviously a public protection. I think we've, we've certainly, um, Sheriff Principal Taylor, the Law Society of Scotland, I've no doubt others will say that it is, it, we're welcoming the regulation of claims management companies. We understand that there is a consultation, a review going on at the moment with uh, Esther Robertson. One thing that I, I can appreciate an anxiety, because what you're, 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 the anxiety is that this come, the changes may make this a more attractive ground for claims management companies. Mm -hmm. You may have evidence on that. We certainly don't. One thing that um, we, we could, you could consider is that you can't regulate claims management companies through this vehicle of this bill, but you can regulate solicitors conduct of civil litigation as a reserved area, so they, they would need a lawyer to carry out certainly the appearance in court, and there is a way of regulating the lawyers in what instructions they are able to take from claims management companies. But this is something that, um, it depends on how long, effectively, the, 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 reg the regulation review is going to, to be. If there's going to be a lag, how long is that lag? Clearly, we would, it would be optimal to have it all wrapped up, but we certainly would, our position on balance is we wouldn't want to delay the implementation of this bill until these, this regulation review has concluded. But if there is a way to manage it, it may well be by looking at regulation of the solicitors who accept instructions from CMCs. So this is something that you think should be in the bill, actually? I haven't, in fairness, it hasn't, we haven't consulted on it, it isn't in the bill. Um, we would want some more time to think about it, but I appreciate there's a bit, just from the discussion, there's a bit of anxiety about implementation of this bill uh, without regulation, but it would need more quality thinking on it. I would agree with that. Uh, but do you think the Scottish Government's position appears to be that uh, th there's a kind of quasi-regulation insofar as the claims management companies are caught by Section 1, uh, as they are providers of relevant legal services. Is it the panel's view that claims management companies are providers of relevant legal services and therefore caught uh, or not? I'm not sure that comprehensively they would be. Because I think there are different, all, not all CMCs are operated, structured in exactly the same way. So you may have a claims management company who employs paralegals, employs uh, and, and carries out work in-house. But you might have a claims management company who effectively is nothing more than a funding vehicle. And then they contract a firm of solicitors to undertake the, legal, the provision of legal services. 
Any other views on that? Well, I, it's not. It, I'm, I'm just to think that it's, it's fair to say that um, the wording may not, uh, looking at it necessarily, depending on how the claims management company is structured, be, might, might not necessarily be caught by Section 1, depending on how they go about their business. Can I take, I think you make a very good point, uh, Kim Leslie, earlier on. The, um, the, the point was made in last week's session that there was a hope that the claims management companies will, the phrase used was wither on the vine. And I think the, the argument was that uh, law firms following this bill will start to take claims management companies in-house. Do you have any view on that, particularly given that presumably if one is a claims management company, one remains unregulated. If a law firm takes a claims management company in-house, it becomes subject to all the perfectly appropriate regulation that the law society would expect and therefore becomes less attractive. Is that fair? Or arguably more, I mean, it seems to be more attractive because effectively you, what you're doing is you're allowing businesses to compete, solicitors, firms um, who, who don't need a... Who, with the introduction of this, would not need a claims management company to offer a DBA. So, the, arguably, it is, it is a selling point to the public. Come to us, we're regulated. Come to us, there are addi additional protections available to you that you would not get from a claims management company. Um, it, what effectively you're doing is, is, is widening the market by introducing damages-based agreements. Mm -hmm. Whether the claims, mani claims management companies in part have existed because there is no alternative to funding. So on one view, if you are offering this work as a solicitor's firm, you, you may not need a claims management company. What are they adding? What, what are they bringing to the party that you can't do yourselves? Lack of regulation. But you, the solicitor is regulated. So they're the ones that are providing the legal services. Yes. Uh, rec recommendation 75 in Taylor's uh, report suggested that the Law Society should make it a ground of professional misconduct for a solicitor to accept a referral from a claims management company, um, which cold calls. And my understanding is that around or just north of 40% of cold calls uh, are, are around accident claims. So do you know, will the Law Society be looking to implement this recommendation going forward? I would want to take some advice on that. I can't talk to you t today. Thank you. Okay, Mary Fee. Um, convener, good morning, panel. Can I move on now to um, discuss third-party litigation funding? Because the bill would make it possible for third-party funders to be found liable for legal expenses. Um, and the evidence that, that we've had, um, the Law Society, you spoke of unintended consequences. And Mr. Dorolo, your submission suggests that um, certain sections of the bill should be um, reworded because there's concerns that um, trade unions, insur insurers, and and solicitors might be caught up in this. Now, the Scottish Government have given an, an assurance that those organisations will not be exempt, and that's not who the bill is, is aimed at. Could you um, perhaps expand on your concerns and tell us how you think those concerns should be dealt with? In, in relation to this, it's, I think it's really a drafting problem. The concern is that the way that the bill mm. is currently framed, it would catch... Uh, people that it's not intended to catch. The idea behind this provision, as I understand it, is to deal with, um, uh, in the more, more in the commercial context, uh, people uh, using as an investment vehicle the funding of litigation and to make them liable for expenses in these kinds of situations. The, 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 the concern is that the, the way that the bill is framed, it's, it's, it's wide enough to catch uh, potentially even solicitors' firms themselves offering this, this service, that not just trade unions and, and the like. So, it, it, and I think, as I understood, having read Mr Goodall's evidence, there is an, under, there is an understanding that this needs to be uh, re looked at again and redrafted in order to make it clear that that's not going to happen. Mm. So, would you like it to state explicitly who would be caught up with this? Well, I, it's difficult. Um, I, I think it possibly might be, it, it should be clear 
and explicit. Mm. Uh, how you achieve that is a matter for the draftsman, I think. Okay, um, okay. Ms. Leslie. J just because this is not uh, accepted from family proceedings, so just who could be caught? So imagine a divorce proceeding where father um, is providing funding to daughter who is going through a, a divorce. Arguably, they are caught by this. You also have a situation where solicitors offering DBAs would, would be caught if they paid for an outlay, which then creates a biz bizarre situation where the solicitor may be better just simply n not preparing the case because if they if they put them if they if they pay for an outlay, they are effectively putting their, their th th themselves forward as third party funders. It's clearly a drafting issue. It needs to be looked at again. Okay. So do you think if, if nothing was done potentially, um, particularly solicitors might be put off taking cases because they might get caught up in this? I mean, it, it effectively, if you're offering a, a damage-based agreement and you're, you're, you're saying, I'll pay for your outlays, as soon as you pay for a medical report, you're caught, and that means that if you lose the case, the, the solicitor's firm would be found liable would, would in liable. Dam uh, expenses. Mm. Mr Stevenson, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, the, the concerns that have already been expressed, I think, are, 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 are ones I would share. I, I do think it's a drafting issue as well. I think it needs to be tidied up and, and just made clear who's who's going to be uh, liable to be drawn into the, the net here. OK, thank you. And the, the Scottish Government um, has stated that it would amend the bill so that transparency requirements around funding were not linked to liability to pay um, expenses. Do you, do you have any other concerns about the revealing funding arrangements? At the moment, I have to say, <laughs> Maybe, I mean, there may be a things that I'm not suggesting that everything's okay, but I, I can't think of anything at the moment, I'm afraid. Okay, but if you do, it would be helpful. We will. Like I will. Yes, you know, indeed. Uh, we would appreciate that. Ms. Leslie? Dad. Mr. Stevenson? Dad either. Okay. Thank you, convener. Finney. Mm. Oh, Ben. Right. Just, just a small point, and, and just for clarity and transparency, I'm no longer a non practicing member of the Lost Society of Scotland, but I'm still on the role of solicitors. Uh, section 32 of the Lost Society submission states the, that they would suggest an exclusion of after-event insurers. I just wondered if you could just specify why you think that's important. Well, again, it, it's, a, it's effectively the cost. So if you're, being, if you're allowing solicitors to offer DBAs, it's got to be meaningful. And so, again, if, 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 if that will still, the, the cost involved in that will still be prohibitively expensive if the, if the after the event insurers are, are caught by third party funding arrangements. Okay, thank you. John Finney. Uh, thank you, um, convener, uh, morning panel. Um, I'd like to ask about um, group proceedings. The, the bill will empower the court of session to bring forward rules. Could you maybe outline your position on the provisions in the bill regarding that, please? Yes, uh, certainly. The, the, the Law Society originally was a bit more ambitious, but has, has uh, on reflection, uh, agreed this is, this is novel. We haven't, we haven't got this before. So the simplest route is maybe not the, the, the wrong choice. Um, the, the Law Society has suggested in their response that we distinguish between liability and causation, because in the, the bill there is a restriction for for jury trials, so there's, there, you're not allowed jury trials, which, given that there may be scope once all common issues of liability and causation have been dealt with, there may be some people, some um, pursuers, whose claim may be better dealt with or could, could be dealt with by, by juries. So we didn't really quite understand why there was that um, that, that restriction was encapsulated to both liability causation and then quantification of damages. So we wanted to, to, to bring that to the attention and say, because of course there is always an argument that can be made by the defender if a pursuer is making an application for the case to be heard by jury, which is it's too complex, it's not suitable. So that there's a hurdle to be got over at that point anyway. Just to, I, I welcome these proposals. The, 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 there is a long-standing need for 
um, uh, provision in relation to group proceedings. Um, it's not the easiest matter to resolve by way of legislation, uh, as long as I think the the the, um, the provisions are enabling and will allow the court system and through court rules to to work through a, a method of dealing with these matters. But it's a significant improvement on what we have at the moment, which is nothing by way of, we have no provision at all. So it's very important. I mean, there are lots of examples of cases going through the courts where there are groups involved and there isn't a specific provision in the rules for this. Uh, it's something the Gill uh, report highlighted and it's long overdue. Okay, thank you. Uh, and finally, if I may, um, it's, it's just something that's mentioned in the Law Society evidence, Ms. Leslie, and um, something was mentioned by Principal Taylor, Chair Principal Taylor, but it's not in the bid, and that is the Contingent Legal Aid Fund. Could, could you comment on that, please? Y yes, certainly. This was something that we, we picked up on that was in the, re the recommendations but didn't find its way into the, the bill. The, the, the Contingent Legal Aid Fund is effectively um, for cases where you don't know if you've got a case or not. So, for example, clinical negligence. Somebody comes to you, a medical... Um, Something has gone wrong medically, but of course we don't know whether this is a case that that has merit or not. So you'd have to get a report from a suitable expert to say whether, in fact, there is a there has been a clinical negligence. So this is effectively where you would go to the the fund before you offer a DBA as a precursor to enable you to get the outlay paid for to determine whether there's a case or not on the understanding that if there is a case and you're successful, you pay back that outlay to the Legal Aid Board. But, but does the, the absence from the bill suggest that anything's changed with that? Or do... Well, it was just... It, 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 we were just suggesting it was a good idea and it, it, it may well be benefit from being actually on the face of the bill. OK. Thank you very much, Dave. Then, very briefly, just to conclude. A very small point. Thank you, Convener goes back to the group proceedings in section 17. I, re I read with interest in the Law Society submission that it states that interestingly England and Wales distinguishes class actions and group actions um, and that it's not clear whether this has been deliberately omitted from the current draft and it would be helpful for this to be considered. I just wondered if you could substantiate and elaborate okay. on that. Because this is this is novel and there's some some terminology which we, which is interchanging as I understand it Class, action, class actions are like opt-out, whereas GLOs or group procedure are, are opt-in. So I don't want to elaborate yet further, but that, that is something that we've picked up on, that there may well be some language that's been used that may not actually mean the same thing. So it's, it's almost about making sure that the public's expectations aren't uh, inflated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I suppose, finally, can I just ask if you think the provisions in the bill will have the net effect of over-rewarding solicitors? There's, there's still an issue with recoverability of judicial expenses. Um, the, the fact of the matter is we are, we are looking for ways, imaginative ways, of getting paid properly for the work that we do. The essential point is that there, there's going to be a cap, which was going to be done by statutory instrument or presume some mechanisms on, on and, and therefore the uh, ability to recover or the ability to uh, obtain a fee will be subject to uh, control. And, and, and if there is a need to modify matters in due course, then that can be that can be that can be done. And Mr. That's, that's right, though. As, as I indicated at the outset, there's, there's still secondary legislation to come in, so that will no doubt uh, keep, things, uh, keep things reasonable. And is it dependent on that to keep it reasonable? Well, I think that it's clearly envisaged that there, there will be further control. Uh, it, it's a package, so... I don't think that one can look at one in isolation from the other. Um, it, it, we need to see what, the, le what the, the secondary legislation says, but I would anticipate that will um, 
ensure that there's control over how this, this primary legislation operates and that that will provide a reasonable package. Can I thank the witnesses for attending what's been a very um, comprehensive evidence session and I now suspend to allow a change of wit witnesses and a short comfort break of 10 minutes.
Welcome our second panel of witnesses, Callum McPhail from the Association of British Insurers, Luke Petherbridge, Senior Public Affairs Manager, Association of Brit British Travel Agents, Andrew Lothian, Member of the Expenses Sector Focus Team and Partner with DWFLLP, Forum of Insurance Lawyers, and David Holmes, Head of Legal, Scotland and Corporate, Medical and Dental Defence uh, Union uh, for Scotland. Uh, can I thank again all the witnesses for providing written submissions, which again is hugely helpful for the committee and can I start by asking the panel whether they support the introduction of damaged based agreements who'd like to start mm -hmm. Mr Pether uh, convener uh, but I'm, yeah. I'm happy to, to start um, I think in the main um, these are contracts between pursuers and pursuers solicitors and um, the, the members of, of my, organisa my organisation, FOIL, uh, are uh, comfortable in principle with damages-based agreements being um, available for solicitors. I should say they are available just now, they're just unenforceable and th there is a distinction, but uh, it makes sense for them to be regulated. Um, the issues we have with them, I suspect you're going to come on to separately um, in relation to future losses, so I'll, I'll just pause there. Okay, so it's a qualified yes. A qualified yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Mr McPhail? I would, I would echo Mr Lothian's comments. The, no objection in principle is very much uh, something for, for a pursuer and their, their agent to have an agreement on. Um, but we do have concerns about future losses. And is that the view of the other panel members? That's yes, helpful. That would also okay. be um, The Association of British Insurers has highlighted research which suggests that consumers do not understand the DBAs and do not shop around between providers. Can perhaps the, the representatives from ABA explain the results in more detail? I'm not sure I actually have that information immediately to hand. Can I just check with one of my colleagues? Yes, please? absolutely. Uh, we could perhaps move on to... Uh, we have that? If not, then you can get back we to the committee to in, in writing. That, yeah. Okay. Uh, the bill's provisions would allow a solicitor to keep judicial expenses awarded in the case as well as a charge, uh, as well as charge a, a success fee. Do the panel members think this is justified? Mr Holmes. Uh, the comments that uh, my organisation have made uh, are looking to draw out that for a claimant solicitor, uh, there are three levels of recovery. There are the judicial expenses that are recovered at the moment. There will be the, the DBA agreement with the client. And thirdly, as of now, a claimant can apply for an additional fee from the court. Uh, and that's a fee that uh, is to reflect the, uh, the, there are a range of factors that could come into play, the importance of the case, the value of the case, uh, the complexity of the case, the amount of work that has to be done. That, that is a reimbursement to the solicitor who is representing the claimant if they are the successful party in the case. So uh, as an organisation, we don't have an issue with the DBA success fee the recovery of judicial expenses, but we think that there might be room for looking at reforming some of the means of recovery of additional fee in the circumstances I've described. Okay. If I, if I could just echo that, the, the position of the additional fee I think is quite important because I think there was some evidence perhaps about this last week. In higher value cases, the solicitors judicial expenses, which is the first type of recovery that Mr. Holmes mentioned, will be a, normally a five-figure sum. Uh, the additional fee is calculated as a percentage of that, and that can sometimes be 100%, 150% of, of the first amount. And then on top of that, there's potentially a, a, a DBA under the bill as well. So the solicitor's being effectively paid three times already for working on the case. The reason I mention all of that is that it plays into uh, some points that we might develop um, later on in the case, uh, later on in the in the discussion uh, this okay. morning. 
that's helpful to, to set that out at the uh, moment. Madam Convener, I've just had a little bit of clarification. I, th I think the point that was made was actually in relation to CFAs. Um, and I think we're happy to, to, to write to you further on that with the, the details of the, the report that was referred to. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, moving on, Rona. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, I wonder if the panel would like to see greater uh, protection for compensation for future loss included in the bill. We've, we've, we've covered that quite a lot, as you know, with the, the earlier panel, so I just would like your views on it. I think if, if I could go first, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, I think our position is that future losses, uh, and here in the main we're talking about the most seriously injured victims, future losses are calculated very carefully according to an actuarial table. There are care reports. Uh, the losses are calibrated in order to provide care for the future. Uh, there's no basis, as far as we can see, why some of those losses should be paid over to lawyers and that they should stay with a victim. I think... In the Taylor report, Sheriff Principal Taylor recognised that issue. Uh, his difficulty, uh, as I understand it, was more to do with the practicalities. If a case settles out of court, as most cases do, how do we know which part of the £5 million settlement is for the future and which part is for the past? And, and that is a practical issue. And there are a number of ways that that could potentially be dealt with. But one of them would be to say... That, uh, to set a threshold above a certain level, the deduction isn't 2.5% under the DBA, but could be, for example, nothing. Uh, and the solicitor is still going to be paid because they're still paid their judicial expenses and they're still, in cases of that value, they are always going to get an additional fee. So that's the position so, that so exists So you now. feel it's more heavily weighted towards the solicitor to benefit uh, at, uh, as it stands? Yes, I, I, think, I just think it's... Our members think it's unnecessary. It, it, right. That is the pursuer's money. It should stay with the pursuer. Mm -hmm. And there are ways that that can be addressed. Uh, a threshold could be set beyond which there could be no deduction. And the, pers uh, the pursuer solicitor still has an incentive mm -hmm. to pursue the case uh, above that level um, because they have a professional obligation to do so and they'll be paid the judicial expenses and an additional fee anyway. Okay. Any other views? I think from an insurer's point of view, our, our view is that, that people who have been injured through no fault of their own should be compensated um, for pain and suffering, and that in include, includes past and future losses. And um, we would support that we, we get to a situation where as, as close to 100% of their damages are received by, by the pursuer themselves. Okay. Mr Holmes? Um, I think it's relevant to bear in mind the context of the discount rate change that we've had uh, in February this year that I'm sure the committee will be aware of. That change brought in by the Lord Chancellor, indeed by ministers uh, in Scotland, uh, were, was said to be to ensure that the full damages are available uh, for the severely injured party to, mm -hmm. for all their future care. Mm -hmm. Mr Petherbridge. I think the only thing I would say on that is to echo the comments of, of Callum to say that we would support the principle that the claimant should retain as much of any award uh, as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of supplementaries. Liam MacArthur, followed by Ben McPherson and then Liam Kerr. Thank you, uh, convener. Good morning. Um, you will have heard the response to the, um, to the same line of questioning from the Deputy Convener um, in, the, in the previous panel. Where ostensibly, I think what the Law Society were saying is that you would have um, not you would have an actuarial table, um, but you would also then have um, a range of, of um, projected future costs um, put forward by the defence, put forward by pursuers and actually the, the the gap between those is very often going to exceed and exceed by some uh, margin the, the two and a half percent um cap being proposed here so in a sense well i think all of us would want to ensure that any future costs of, of a claimant um, are fully and properly met um, does it pose the risk that i think is inherent in in, in the sort of line of argument that you're prosecuting, given that what we're, we're dealing with here generally is a, is a range of uh, estimates of, of, uh, of, of future costs going forward? I think ultimately there are a range of estimates, or there is a range of estimates, but what is ultimately determined is the right amount of compensation for the pursuer. 
Um, it wouldn't be surprising if the pursuers' solicitors argued for a higher figure and the defenders' f solicitors for a lower figure. That's their job. But at the end of the day, <coughs> the figure that's arrived at is intended to be the correct figure to provide for their future care. And you don't see a risk, and again, this was, this was I suppose, put to us um, less so today, but um, in the evidence session last week, that the additional um, uh, work and, and complexity involved in some of these cases um, uh, would mean that it's potentially the case that, that some of them would not be taken forward, taken forward as successfully, uh, were there not some form of, of, of uh, reward, um, and, and that in a sense that that is a, that is a risk, that, that while we want to see those costs, future costs met um, going forward, we'd also want to make sure that, that, that no case um, that was um, that, that had validity and all the rest of it uh, was, was embarked upon in the first instance because of that complexity and the additional workload that would be involved in bringing it forward. No, I, I don't see a risk because that, if you like, the position that you've just described is the position now. Um, and solicitors are, are more than adequately compensated, in our view, for, for those cases. The, the fees, with the addition of the additional fee, can be very, very significant, and, and rightly so, in these higher value cases. Um, the more work the solicitor does, the higher the judicial expenses will be. The higher the judicial expenses are, the additional fee will be higher too, because it's calculated as a percentage of that. Um, ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Uh, again, a, a question for Andrew Lothian and, and Foyle. The written evidence that you've supplied makes two strong statements around this. One, at 19, to safeguard pursuers, we strongly support an overall cap on the success fee. And then at 21, that you believe that a complex mechanism is, is unnecessary in, and that to, to avoid this entirely, you would submit ring fencing future losses and making them exempt from the DBA uh, stroke SFA. I just, for clarity, can you just put that in the context of the other statements you've made around the, the threshold and, and the, uh, the, the answer to Liam yes. MacArthur as well? Yeah. I, I, so in a case where an award is made by a judge or, or by a jury, it would be possible to identify what the future losses are and to ring fence them because they are known, they are identified. Uh, however, in a case which settles out of court, that will be harder because it's settling for, a, it, in uh, current circumstances, it's settling for a lump sum, an amount, and the distinction between future and past losses is not described within that amount. And that's why, uh, as an alternative, uh, we're suggesting that a, a threshold would operate um, as a means of protecting what are likely to be future losses. There are, there are other potential mechanisms, a threshold is only one, um, but what we're, we're trying to avoid is the, the sort of complex mechanism that the bill envisages to deal with the conflict of interest that the bill creates. And I, th I think that was a point that was made in the earlier se uh, session today. Um, that can be avoided either by some sort of cap um, or threshold in cases which settle out of court and ring fencing future damages in cases which settle uh, or where the court makes the award. Okay, thank you for clarifying that point around threshold and cap. That, that's helpful. Thanks. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just, uh, th this was a point I made to a previous panel uh, because it does concern me. If we, is there a risk in this panel's view that there is ultimately an inflation of awards given by the court in the sense that it, to, to ensure that future losses, uh, one of you made the point earlier uh, that a pursuer should get the full amount. I think, Mr. Holmes, you said the pursuer should get the full amount. Does the court say, okay, to ensure the pursuer gets the full amount, we will add the legal fees on, whether explicitly or not explicitly, and you end up with uh, inflation of the awards? And with your insurer's hats on, if there was that inflation, what impact does that have on your business models and the premium to the consumer at the other end? I think it raises potentially um, a driver or an expectation for the pursuer themselves being aware that 
an element of their damages is not going to be theirs, that um, that they will look for a higher amount than they might ordinarily. Um, and I think that may actually have the result of, of driving cases into litigation that might otherwise have settled out of court. Um, I, I understand the, the point you're making about how the courts would, would view that. Um, I'm not sure I'm entirely qualified to, to comment on how the courts, uh, any individual court would view that, but I, I can certainly understand the concern that that, that awareness might, might colour how they approach it. Um, and obviously, if, if we see um, that, particularly in, in court awards, then we will see an increased expectation in pre-litigation awards. So, so we will see what we might, um, you know, we will see claims damages inflation, which increases the cost of claims. And ultimately, would have an impact on our customers' claims experience, or if our, some of our customers we deal with, we handle claims with their money. So it's a direct impact to, to their bottom line or to our customers' claims experience, which obviously colours how their renewals are, are viewed. Anyone else? Could I answer just the second leg of your question about impact on premiums? The, the MDDS that I represent today is a rather different organisation because it's not an insurer. It's a not-for-profit organisation that has no shareholders and it has uh, 14,000 members of the medical and dental profession in membership in Scotland. So if there is claims inflation, either in level of award or number of cases coming forward, mm -hmm. that will uh, directly correlate to what uh, GPs and dentists have to pay for their uh, indemnity, um, uh, indemnity subscription on an annual basis. So the, there's a slight difference with, with the organisation I represent today because uh, there isn't a shareholder body sitting behind an insurer, say. It's, it's a more direct correlation with, uh, uh, with, with the membership. So claims inflation, either in level of damages or, or frequency of claim, would, would be a significant concern for us. I would highlight here as well that for the travel industry, we're also not, the vast majority of claims in the travel sector do not fall back on an insurer. They are within the deductible um, of, of the tour operator. <coughs> so again, I would echo that comment that we have some concerns around infl um, claims inflation and the knock-on impacts of that in terms of premiums that our membership will be paying. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mary Google. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, the point I'd like to come to is about qualified uh, one-way cost shifting. And particularly it was foil in the written evidence you submitted to the committee where you comment that if COX is implemented without appropriate safeguards, there will be significant adverse consequences, including increase in nuisance calls, increase in fraudulent claims and higher insurance premiums. Uh, uh, all and then you go into f further detail about that. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that point and outline what additional safeguards you would like to see if the, the bill is, goes through. Thank you. Yes, um, the, the safeguards that we think are, are important to Quarks are really to, to, to balance it. Um, some of them were in the Taylor review and are not in the bill, um, but the world has moved on since um, Sheriff Principal Taylor uh, uh, finished his, his report. Um, in the Taylor review, uh, as has been discussed previously, there was provision that claims management companies should be regulated. We might come back to that, mm -hmm. I imagine, here. Um, but that's one thing. Um, the, the second part of Taylor that is not in the bill um, is uh, something that was discussed earlier where a pursuer doesn't beat a, a, a tender, the sealed offer, um, the offer is £10,000, the pursuer rejects it, they go to court, they only get eight, they still have full quarks protection despite the defender offering more than the case is actually worth. That's not in the bill. We might come back to that too. Um, Sheriff Principal Taylor also recommended that it should be an offence, a criminal offence, to pay a referral fee to someone who's not a regulated person or for a regulated an unregulated person to receive a referral fee. 
So if you're paying or receiving a referral fee, you should be a regulated person, otherwise it's a criminal offence. And that's not in the bill either, uh, as I read it. So there are important safeguards that were in Taylor that are not, not in the bill. Over and above that, because the, in our view the world has moved on, and we might talk in a minute about the fact that there are now more claims in Scotland, more injury claims in Scotland than there have ever been before, um, there are other safeguards that we think would assist. Uh, and I'm not yet coming to the exceptions to quarks, but uh, there, there are procedural steps that can help. For example, um, there are steps that the courts have put in place in England and Wales um, that might assist, and I, I can write to the committee with some detail on that if that would help, so I don't get too far <laughs> into the detail now. Um, but th there's no anticipation of those coming through here, at least they're not in the bill, uh, and we, we have no indication that they will be coming through the court system either. Um, so, so those are some of the things. Um, I'm just going to pause there because the next thing I would say would be about the exceptions to quarks, um, and that might take me on in, into someone else's area. But it, that's the, the answer to your question just now. If I uh, thank you. Yes, because attenders, claims management companies that will be covered by other members. I wondered if anybody else had anything further to comment on that. I think we have a real concern that we will see a further influx of claims and management companies in, into Scotland. Um, I think it's already um, identified that, that that's happening as it is. I think we're very conscious um, of what is happening in England and Wales, um, the work that has been done to try and, and uh, deal with th that. I think we're very conscious that, that there is regulation in England and Wales of claims, man claims management companies for the protection um, of, of the man in the street, of the consumer. Um, and we, we don't have that uh, in place at the moment. That's currently under review in England and Wales to transfer to the FCA. Um, but I think understanding where changes have, have happened in England and Wales around the, the compensation culture, as, as it might be described, um, we are seeing that, that that has created more pressure um, on less scrupulous bodies. Uh, and our concern is that with um, the advent of quarks, removal of the risk, that we will see uh, that happen um, in an accelerated way in Scotland. Uh, if I can use a bit of conjecture, uh, um, in 2019, the UK, the UK government have said that they, they intend to um, stop entitlement to claim PPI claims uh, by mid-2019. These are very, very sophisticated, sophisticated companies that, that use um, uh, or pursue those claims on behalf of people. They will be looking for somewhere else to, to generate their, their, their revenue. Um, some of the uh, activity uh, currently being considered around whiplash um, changes small claims track uh, in England and Wales will, will move uh, business models uh, and uh, as we see it at the moment uh, there is a real risk that we will see a, an influx with all the challenges, increased nuisance calls which I think have been referenced earlier um, into Scotland. It's probably worth adding our experience of uh, since the introduction of Cox which certainly is the travel industry in England and Wales we've seen an increase in claims uh, of more than 500% on average uh, across our membership since the introduction of quarks. Um, so we certainly do think there is a risk here for increasing the activity of claims management companies uh, in Scotland for an introduction of this regime. Okay, thank you. I would just have a question. I presume you heard the, the last session of evidence that we took as well, and it was the suggestion from the, I think it was the Faculty of Advocates, that uh, you know, this D David and Goliath situation that, that we talked about before, um, that if Quarks was limited to people who uh, either had insurance or the, the larger organisations, is that a suggestion that you would be in agreement with? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Lee MacArthur, do you have a follow-up? Uh, conscious of a couple of issues that um, we've, we've touched on there. I mean, I, I, again, I think drawing on the evidence we, we heard from the last panel um, in relation to the shifting picture um, of, of claims um, from uh, the time that Chair Principal Taylor was taking his evidence and, and producing his report uh, to now, um, where we'd seen a rapid um, uh, increase year on year um, over a period in, in, in claims being brought forward south of the border, um, a, a less 
um, pronounced increase in Scotland, and that's effectively reversed um, in, in the kind of more recent past, which um, would tend to suggest that the, the point, Mr. Pellebridge, you were making about a, a, a rapid increase in terms of, of claims that you're seeing, 500%. Um, I'm not sure where it's coming from, but it, it, it must be matched by a, a, a significant decrease in, in other areas if those figures are to be uh, believed. But I think the point that again, the Law Society was making was that um, quarks will apply um, to cases brought to, to court with civil action is, is, is brought forward, and, and, and a lot of the DW data reflects claims um, that are that, that go nowhere near court um, and therefore getting an accurate picture of what the impact that quarks should have here albeit the discussion around safeguards will come to and um, will be will, will be pivotal in determining that but actually the figures may not necessarily um, be as, as as straightforward to interpret as, as perhaps they, they first appear and I pick up on that um, there, there are a couple of points if I may that's absolutely right in the sense that the majority of claims do, do not ever reach court. They're never litigated. And it's something like 85% of injury claims uh, never even result in a court case being raised. In the main, that's because they're settled before they reach that point. But the rules that apply to litigated cases go right through to the very start of a claim, even if it's never litigated. Because in the mind of the pursuer solicitor who's advancing that claim, often through the, the protocol, um, and in the mind of the insurer at all times is what will happen if this is litigated. So uh, this will have a, a huge impact on every single claim, whether it's litigated or not. It, it, it doesn't matter. And the decisions about whether to, to pay a little bit more because the pursuer has got quacks will be taken pre-litigation just as much as they will be taken post-litigation. Mm. I think if, if I can pick up on a, on a couple of other points, if I can, the... Um, the, the rate of claim in England is actually going down. It's a negative, it's negative growth, if you like. Mm. It's, it's declining. It's about 4% a year. The, the claims are going down in England, and we're seeing this, this substantial increase in, in Scotland. And the, the, the reason, from a much lower base, we've been told. From a, from a much lower base, that's absolutely right. And there are dangers with comparing ourselves to England. I yeah. don't know why we keep doing that, <laughs> but um, leaving that to one side. Um, the reality is that this is a form of arbitrage by claims management companies. It's not injured people choosing which, which place to litigate in. It's about business models determining where they are going to bring their activities, where they are going to generate, in many cases, claims. And you, you raised the point about, um, about travel claims increasing, and I'll let Mr. Petherbridge speak about that, but that, that's right because there had to be some other decline somewhere else. And the decline somewhere else in England has been in road traffic claims because quacks came in, but claimant costs were capped. So the margin reduced in that area of work. The risk reduced, but the margin reduced too. And what happened? The business model moved on to, to travel claims. And the risk is that for us in Scotland, because we're bringing in quacks, we're not banning referral fees, we're not immediately going to regulate claims management companies, and there's no discussion about reducing costs. That, that we're in the same position. Although, I mean, again, drawing on the evidence we've already heard, and, and I mean, I take the point in relation to the regulation of, of compensation uh, of claims companies, um, but there was a pretty heavy um, hint from um, the bill team um, before us a couple of weeks ago uh, that that is coming down the track. And if you were looking at your business model, would you would you seriously be looking at a business model um, that was ignoring the fact that this is this is coming down the track in terms of where you would seek to operate and how you'd build, build that business model going forward? Well, we're looking at a delay of uh, several years. Um, As we are with the implementation of this bill. I mean, in a sense, they're going in parallel. So, so when those, those provisions come forward, we'll, it will march ahead at the same kind of pace as, as the implementation of this well, well, legislation should be passed. If that is the case, that, that will be something we would entirely support. Um, claims management company regulation uh, and this bill becoming effective on the same date would be a, a major step forward. If that doesn't happen and if the bill is implemented before CMC regulation, uh, as, as might be a risk, then from the CMC's point of view, it's really a flick of a switch. Um, they are technology enabled, they are in many cases um, uh, highly efficient, they, they are largely call centres. It's very easy to add in some postcodes into the areas that you're going to phone. 
Yeah, I mean, just to add a bit of clarity on the travel space. I mean, the big problem travel has uh, in England and Wales, and will also have here in Scotland, is uh, the exclusion of travel from the pre-action protocol, um, which made us particularly vulnerable to the activity of claims management companies and particularly attractive to claims management companies. Um, so we'll pick that up uh, separately with, with the Scottish Government and, and try and, and Scottish uh, Civil Justice Council. Um, I think we would say, going back to the principle of sharing the risks of litigation within the bill, um, that we, we simply don't see, and we're going to come on to Cox in more details, I won't cover this in detail, but uh, we simply don't see the right balance within the bill currently. Um, I mean, paragraph 59 of the financial memorandum accepts the premise that the bill incentivizes settlement of claims that do not have merit. That doesn't seem to us to be good policy. And certainly as an industry that has struggled with that, we wouldn't like to see that introduced. Although I think, again, the point was made that this is happening already. I mean, what the, the financial memorandum doesn't go on to is, is quantify the extent to which that may, may, may shift. Yes, John Finney. Hey, thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr Lothian, uh, a casual listener might think that this is incredibly public-spirited of you, um, making some of the representations you do. And you talk about the business model of claims companies. That's not in any way dissimilar from the business model of insurance companies, which make massive profits. Um, well, I think the distinction is that in Scotland, insurance companies are, are regulated. And claims management companies are not. And operate the same, same sort of business model as the claims companies. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand in what sense it's the same. A, a claims management company can open... Um, could, we could open one this afternoon uh, above a garage and we'd be, we'd be in business. And nobody would be regulating us or checking our contracts or there'd be no one to complain to. Whereas with an insurance company, um, the, as I understand it, I'm not an insurer, um, but as I understand it, they are heavily regulated. Okay. Could, could, I, could I perhaps pick up on your point about, about the massive profits? I think, I'm just checking, but I think, I think I'm correct in saying that in the last 25 years in the UK motor insurance market, two companies have in individual years made underwriting profits on their motor books. Only two individual companies in 25 years. I'm sorry, I don't get the point of that. Well, you're, you're talking about massive profits that insurers are making. And I'm, quite sure that, I'm quite sure that the business model isn't predicated in one form of insurance. Thank you. Um, Maurice Corey. Yes, thank you, Karina. Um, you, you referred, Mr. Petheridge, about um, not the right balance Can you, uh, of the Quox situation. Can you explain more on that, why you feel so? Yeah, I mean, certainly our experience uh, in England and Wales has been that a very low proportion of claims um, see the reversal of quarks. Uh, I think the financial memorandum picks up that it's 0.1% of cases in England and Wales currently. So we certainly don't feel uh, that the balance is struck correctly in England and Wales or that the bill does so um, at, the, at present. Uh, I think we would agree there's some wording that needs changing around 4A. Um, but fundamentally, we, we want to see a better balance in Scotland than what we have in England and Wales, is the point I was trying to make. Right, OK. Do, do the rest of the panel agree with Mr Brotheridge? Yes, I would agree. Any comments to make on that? Uh, are we coming to questions on tenders and exceptions more generally, or would you like comments on... Yes, we will be, we will be, yes. Can I, can I ask a further question, Karina? Yes, please. Exactly. Um, a number of respond respondents have suggested that the test of fraud should be re replaced with the English test of fundamental dishonesty, but Sheriff Principal Taylor thought that this would not be well understood in Scotland. What are your, your views of this, all of you? I could go first briefly. I think um, it, it, it's not a major issue. I, I, I think one of the benefits potentially of having fundamental dishonesty is that there's already uh, case law in England and Wales uh, on that definition, so the risk of satellite litigation might be less if we adopt a test that's already been um, considered by the courts in the context of personal injury claims. Um, th that, that might be a benefit. Right, okay. Any comments, Mr. Gill? I, I think um, I was aware of a comment that was made in the, the previous session about um, there being a material increase in the value of claim to, to try and uh, identify what was fraudulent behaviour, and I'd certainly encourage that. I think we've seen, um, particularly in recent times, cases where 
Um, I, can, I can think of one case where um, uh, that was recently in, in court where the pursuer was claiming for somewhere in the region of £180,000 worth of, in, in terms of damages. Uh, the, the, the judge held that they had concerns about the credibility of the pursuer in a variety of areas of his evidence, but still found that uh, you know, an award of £7,000. Um, and if, if that type of case is, if that's regarded as materially, then I'd certainly support it, because the legal costs in dealing with that claim uh, are, are quite astronomical. Um, so it really is about how we get to a clear and acceptable definition of that. Well, I think there are practical issues that arise. We, on a public policy level, one would want to be looking for a, a deterrent against, for instance, embellishment of mm -hmm. claims which could have a very significant effect on the overall outcome. That's certainly something that we've seen at MDDUS, uh, where we've had concerns and ultimately much lower settlements have been achieved when further evidence has been forthcoming. Can I ask one final question, uh, Kavina? Is, uh, do you have any suggestions how the current tests could be improved, uh, mentioned in the bill? I, I have one, if I, if I could. I, I think the, the test that we've just been discussing in relation to fraud talks about fraud in connection with the proceedings. The majority of claims never reach court, and it might be that that should be in relation to the claim rather than the proceedings. Uh, otherwise, there's no incentive, if you like, to be telling the truth in the majority of cases that never litigate. So it's a, a small point, but hopefully um, a sensible one. Anybody else? No. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to take us back to the claims management companies, uh, if I may. The first question I have to the panel, uh, what do you think are the practical consequences of not formally regulating the claims management companies uh, as part of the bill? Yeah, I, th I think we will, it's already been mentioned, I think we will see an influx of, of claims management companies into, into Scotland. I think we will see the, the, own, um, the onset of the, the type of activity that we see from their, their models, increased nuisance calls. I think we will see an increase in claims uh, or that have little or no merit. I think w one of our fundamental concerns is that our customers expect us, our policyholders expect us to investigate claims, to pay the correct claims and to pay the correct amount for those claims. And, and we entirely agree with that. But where they think there is a claim without merit, they, they have very strong views that they, they do not want their insurer to, to make an economic decision to get rid of it. I think what we envisage is that as we see more of these claims with little or no merit, we, we are going to find that our, our claims departments are inundated with claims that require actually more investigation. And that operational strain will actually get in the way of our handlers dealing with the meritorious claims more expeditiously. And, and so our concern is that we will see pursuers with valid claims actually experiencing delays in, in getting their settlements. I would um, certainly echo that last point. It's certainly something we've seen in the travel industry that the sheer increase that we have seen in volumes of claims has caused a problem to dealing with genuine claimants and nobody is suggesting for a moment that there aren't genuine holiday sickness cases out there. There are. And it's important that we deal with those uh, as, as quickly as we can. I think I'd like to make a couple of practical areas where I think the bill could uh, make some steps here building on the previous evidence session. Um, the first is around transparency obligations. One of the areas where claims management companies thrive is the lack of transparency in the links between claims management companies and solicitor firms. Um, we have called as part of the regulation in England and Wales for um, an obligation to name source of claims, which makes it easier to track things like referral bans. Um, if that were to come in here, and we'd certainly support that. Um, and also notification of alternative sources of dispute resolution um, is something that the bill could deal with. So the Carol Brady review in England and Wales recommended that part of the regulation of claims management companies could be that if there is an alternative dispute resolution scheme available to consumers at low or no cost, then there is an obligation on the claims management company to notify the consumer of that. We see no reason why that couldn't equally apply to solicitors offering DBAs. 
sorry, if, if I could just add a couple of points. I think <coughs> at this stage and until claims management regulation comes in to Scotland, uh, the Scottish consumer is at a disadvantage compared to the consumer in England and Wales. The disreputable claims management company, and they're not all by any means disreputable, but those that are have an incentive to operate in Scotland as opposed to England and Wales. Um, and, and as a result of that, what, what we see is that the deductions from damages can be quite significant. I think in the bill, it's envisaged, it, it was an, there was some useful discussion on this this morning, it was envisaged that section one would apply to claims management companies as well as to um, uh, solicitors. Mm -hmm. The difficulty there is that the solicitor is regulated and the claims management company is not. So if there's a cap on, on DBAs, then the uh, solicitor, if it breached that cap, would quite properly be subject to professional discipline, whereas th there is nothing to catch the, the rival claim, claims management company. Um, and what, what we do see at the moment is that there, there, there is sometimes that deduction twice, once by the solicitor, once by the, by the claims management company, uh, and there would be nothing, there would be no regulation to prevent that um, until they're regulated. If I might just pick you up on that point, Andrew Lothian, the, um, let's say the claims management company does take a significant deduction. They use the words a quite significant deduction from damages. What recourse would I have as the, the man on the street, Mr McPhail said earlier, uh, what recourse do I have? How do I challenge that, uh, either currently or in the immediate future? Do I have any recourse? I'm not aware that you do. Um, I think in future you would have to understand the bill and the um, statutory instruments that lie behind it as an individual um, to know what's enforceable and what isn't. And there's nobody to complain to about that. I'd presumably have to go and consult a solicitor. You would have cost. to go and find a solicitor. Right. Uh, just to pick up on another point that came up earlier, so is it your view panel that uh, the claims management companies will wither on the vine when this bill comes in? Until they're regulated, it will be the opposite. I, I think that there's little doubt, at least that's, that's our, our, um, our strong view. Um, they may well wither on the vine when they are regulated, uh, who knows, um, but the bill puts solicitors on a level playing field with claims management companies only after claims management companies are regulated. Until that time, uh, there's no level playing field between the two, and therefore there's no reason why they should weather on the vine. If I could perhaps just pick up a point and around the incentives for claims management companies are, are to make profit, and there's more money to be made in the claims process in Scotland than there is in England and Wales. Um, it, if I can just use an example, if, if, if you take a, a road traffic claim settlement where damages are awarded at £10,000 in both jurisdictions, the recoverable cost for a solicitor in England excluding, excluding any disbursements is £500, and in Scotland it's over £2,000. We have a situation where Sheriff Principal Taylor talked about it, it, it had, had no objection to referral fees, um, and I think that having that within our within our process and system and, and potentially accepting that that is, that is part of, of what we're allowing it is, a, is a fundamental driver for these, these businesses to continue operating here and to seek to, to operate here because there is money to be made out of the claims process. Thank you. Uh, I have one final question. It goes back to, we were talking earlier about premiums increasing and the cost to uh, small businesses increasing. Uh, and I noticed that the holiday industry, there's uh, in the evidence uh, that a number of travel agents may often be SMEs uh, and the claims may be below their insurance excess, so they don't have insurance backing. It seems to me that if the premiums go up, the people who are most impacted by this are the less well off uh, when purchasing insurance products or when purchasing it to cover their business, perhaps those in rural areas, areas seeking motor insurance. So is it the panel's view that an unintended consequence of this legislation might actually be a long-term reduction in access to justice uh, 
effectively making the court system more accessible, but damages less recoverable. Does that make sense as a question? <laughs> It makes sense as a question, yes. Um, I, I think that's a, a possibility. Uh, uh, I don't think I can speak, uh, um, as, a, as a solicitor and not an insurer, I don't think I can speak about the effect on, on insurance premiums. Um, I have had clients who, who um, have had to defend claims where it falls within their excess and, and they don't have the backing of insurance, and that, that's, that does sometimes happen. Um, and there are the risks that you've otherwise identified. I'm not sure if anyone else would want to pick those up. I think probably that, that is also a risk um, for, for certain local authorities, well, for, for many local authorities as well, around the, the level of deductible they hold, um, so that uh, you know, it is uh, a, a risk to, to public funds as well. I just want to clarify um, a point I was making earlier here. I, I think currently the situation is the majority of claims larger tour operators are within deductibles and are therefore not insurer backed. Uh, what we have began to see is that some of the SME members that previously were relying on insurance can no longer get their um, excess level to a level where they can pass this off to the insurers and that would be a huge concern for the travel industry, particularly because next year the package travel directive is being extended and that will extend obligations for travel sickness claims to many more um, small and medium sized travel companies they don't currently have these obligations. There could also be the wider societal points, the uh, impact that you, you were mentioning, Mr. Kerr. Um, I know the convener's written to the NHS Central Legal Office looking for more information about how they anticipate that the loss of this deterrent will have upon uh, uh, claims frequency and impact on the NHS generally in Scotland. That also would have an effect through my own organisation uh, if, uh, if the deterrent is lost and there are more claims, subscriptions will rise for general practitioners and dentists, most likely. Uh, so there are, there are wide impacts across the NHS generally and perhaps something for discussion whether quacks should apply across all sectors or just in relation to insurers or, uh, or public bodies. That's interesting, thank you. Ben McPherson. Yeah, just very briefly on uh, claims management companies. In the FOIL submission at paragraph 39, there's a suggestion at the end that uh, regulation could be provided most expediently via the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill at Westminster. I just wondered if you could expand on that. Yeah, so uh, um, this is a bill that's going through Westminster just now, as I understand it. Um, th there was, I think, a debate in the House of Lords about whether an amendment to include Scotland within the uh, regulation of claims management companies should be uh, allowed, and I think ultimately the amendment was dropped. But that vehicle is, I think, still available. I think the bill is not yet enacted, as I understand it. Mm. Um, and it would be, I think, possible for the Scottish Government, if it were so minded, to make representations to the UK Government that, at least for the time being, um, the, that Scotland should be included. The, 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 other, the other purposes of the Bill uh, include transferring England and Wales of the regulation of claims management companies to the FCA, which is a, obviously a UK-wide body, so that would be possible. There are, there, are, there are other parts of that Bill that do apply to Scotland in relation to financial assistance and debt management and so on. So it, it would, I think, be um, one option if, if setting up a claims management regulator in Scotland for Scotland is going to take some time, then, then this could step into the gap, perhaps. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Liam McArthur. Thanks so much. On Ben McPherson's line of questioning, I mean, I... I think I raised it with the bill team who, who revealed that they were anticipating uh, moves in relation to regulation, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. But I, I mean, I would hope the minister uh, will be looking at this evidence and, and will come with a response to that specific uh, suggestion, which doesn't seem uh, unreasonable. But I, I think going back to the, the responses to the Kerr's line of questioning, I'm slightly concerned at the suggestion about claims management companies withering on the vine 
because with regulation um, in other parts of the UK, we haven't seen a withering on the vine. There's an acceptance that there are highly reputable claims management companies uh, operating. Um, and I just would question, despite the margins that I think Mr McPhail referred to north and south of the border, we're still dealing with a market in Scotland that is very, very much smaller than a market in the, in the rest of the UK. And therefore, um, I, I just wondered that the extent to which um, Scotland is somehow going to be seen as, as a great nirvana in which the unregulated can, can, can romp to their heart's content, uh, making massive profits when the bulk of the, 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 the work probably remains in, in other parts of the UK, albeit regulated. So we had slightly in danger of, of inflating the, the, the risk here to make an entirely valid point, um, I, I, and that, the, 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 that what we're talking about is probably going to be more, uh, more marginal in terms of the, the, the impacts over the, the next few years. Well, we've already seen the increase in claims. I think that's been discussed previously in previous sessions, so I, 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 don't, I don't need to go in into that. Um, of course, Scotland is a smaller market, um, but we have seen more evidence of claims management company activity in Scotland. For example, in about the last 18 month, months, 16 new claims management companies have opened up in Scotland, according to Companies House. Um, and uh, as Mr McPhail has said, the, the margins are better here. So, of course, the volumes are lower, but the profit per claim is better. So how that plays out um, may be an unintended consequence of the, of the bill. Um, I don't want to overstate things. Uh, it's not my intention. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Fulton. Yeah, the, the, the Scottish Government has given assurances that third party funding provisions will not apply to trade unions or solicitors. And there's also even a statement that will amend the bill to remove the link between transparency requirements and liability to pay expenses. Do panel members have any concerns about these changes? I'm happy to go first. Um, the, the point about third party funding is, in our view, a very important part of the bill. Um, and I, I think that the origin of this lay with uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor's view that uh, a, a venture capitalist or, or someone buying part of a commercial claim uh, who would benefit and, and derive a profit from that claim should also be liable if there are any adverse consequences as well. And the, the way that this is drafted it, it is wider than that. Um, there is an analogy between a claims management company taking a percentage of, a, of a, an injured person's claim and a venture capitalist taking a percentage of a, of a commercial claim. So I think it would be important, and I, th I think the financial memorandum uh, mentions this, that, that a claims management company should be, should be caught uh, and would be caught uh, under the current provisions. If a trade union, and as I understand it, trade unions don't take a percentage of their members' damages, um, so they, they ought not to be caught by this. And, and if inadvertently they are, then then that's something that I would, you know, I, I recognise and I wouldn't think is appropriate. Indeed. I would agree with what Mr Lothian said. I, I think it probably of interest is how, how the disclosure is, is um, actually achieved and, and that it is adhered to and whether there's any implications or should be implications for failure to disclose. Um, but in terms of the overall principles, no objections. Thanks. Okay, John Finney. Thank you. It's, it's a question primarily to, to Mr Holmes, um, but happy to hear from, from others on it. And it's a question asked in the previous session about group proceedings. You, you specifically mentioned it at quite a bit of length, Mr Holmes, and acknowledging that, you know, it would be for the an act of to, to bring forward specifics, but you, you say you have some concerns. Maybe care to outline these, please? Well, the... Um, the MDDOS has been engaged in the group lit litigation concerning the vaginal mesh uh, material, uh, which is working its way through uh, the court of session. Um, we have some uh, concerns about uh, the, the current arrangements that are there, but we readily acknowledge that the efforts have been made by the Lord President in particular to Im improve those matters. We felt particularly issues around adequate judicial resources and also 
continuity in the judge hearing the case was particularly important. Uh, so that was really why we had focused on, on those issues at the tail of our submission. And what is the solution to that then, um, with the, the continuity? I mean, that's presumably desirable in every case, but um, why does that become an issue? Um, is it the duration of any case that would mean that? Well, the, uh, I can't be precise in terms of figures, but the cases in this group have been raised uh, um, for a matter of years, I think, now. Um, and are not at any stage of reaching uh, a conclusion. That's going to be some considerable time uh, on, until they are resolved. They are very complex issues that are being raised in these cases, and they involve a number of parties. And just to clarify, it's more than the one case you outlined there. This is a, a, just a general principle. Um, our experience comes from that group of cases where we have quite a number of cases in that cohort. So that, that's, that's where the experience lies in that particular set of cases for now. OK, thanks. Are the other members of the panel, any comment in the group proceedings at all? Supportive in, in, in as much as if it brings, um, if it brings better efficiency um, and you know, a quicker resolution of these cases, then we would support it. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. There's just one last question. Some of the insurance responders um, have suggested that insurance premiums in Scotland may increase because of the bill's um, provisions. So if now and in the past the environment in Scotland has been less conducive to spurious claims in England, did Scottish customers benefit from reduced pre premiums in comparison to English customers on this basis? I'm not sure I'm in a position to, well, I'm not in a position to, to comment on that, sorry. You could perhaps follow up with some written yep. evidence. Yep. Um, if so, then I'd also like to see if the reverse is true. Is the market for mainstream insurance products currently structured on a UK basis? And if so, is it likely to be worth insurance companies identifying Scottish customers for a small proportion of that market to charge them more? I think that will be something that individual member companies will look at on a, an individual basis. So probably difficult to give a, a, a generalised view on that. OK, but you can answer the first part. Anyone else got a view on that, whether that's likely to be the case? If you could come back and with a, a more full... Um, uh, explanation or um, thoughts on that, that would be much appreciated. But in the meantime, that concludes our questioning. Can I thank all the witnesses uh, for appearing before the committee today? And um, we now move um, to close the meeting. I can just find my briefing report. Um, the next meeting will be on 3rd of October when we begin taking evidence on the offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill. I formally close this meeting. <laughs>